I sympathize with the analysts at Fitch and take my hats off to them for doing this when it's not a moment of brinksmanship. Clearly it's not good news, but if we look at the initial market reaction, pretty moderate reaction in the bond market. No country that has the strength of the U.S. is going to be affected. The main question is, does this compromise the reserve currency status yes. of the U.S. dollar? I have learned very painfully that one never wants to forecast the demise of the dollar. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. From AAA to AA, live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. More than a decade since the last one, it was S&P Global Ratings ditching the top rating for the United States of America. Fitch follows up after the close yesterday with this quote right here. The rating downgrade of the United States reflects the expected fiscal deterioration over the next three years, a high and growing general government debt burden and the erosion of governance relative to AA and AAA rated peers. Lisa, this morning, whether it's justified and if it matters are two different questions. I would agree, especially as we this is the second major uh, rating company to downgrade the United States from the AAA rating. The response arbitrary and based on outdated data. That's Janet Yellen. Uh, Larry Summers, the idea that this is actually an increased default risk is absurd. I don't think Fitch has any new and useful insights into the situation. But here's the question. Is there something real behind this in terms of how much interest rate expenses are going up and how much lack of conviction there is on Capitol Hill? We'll go through the three points. And we'll pick out one of them, governance issues. They're pretty obvious, aren't they? There's clearly governance issues that the United States has that is inconsistent with other AAA rated peers like, say, Germany. I would agree with that, especially because we were talking about the possibility of the U.S. defaulting on their debt, even though it wasn't a fiscal issue. It wasn't an ability to pay. It was a desire to pay. And this really does raise some serious questions. Just to put this into perspective, Fitch first raised this issue back in May. It stuck to its guns even as the U.S. government worked through uh, the debt ceiling. This really highlights the ongoing concern that this will be an issue every year going forward. Equities right now negative about three quarters of one percent on the S&P 500. In the bond market, yields are just about unchanged, a little north of four percent at 4.02 percent. Lisa, the market fallout. Can we call this fallout on the screen this morning? What do you make of that? To be completely honest, I was reading notes saying that this had to do with the Fitch downgrade, and I said I don't buy it. I think this probably uh, is, I read one person comment that this is an excuse to sell and to capitalize on some of the gains, especially in light of some of the weakening data out of China, out of the weakening data in certain sectors across the world. I buy that more than I do this, because the move has been always the same, go into treasuries, the exact opposite uh, of what you would expect if there was an increased default risk. You mentioned the pushback that came from the administration. This was the pushback that came from Secretary Yellen. Fitch's decision does not change what Americans, investors and people all around the world already know, that Treasury securities remain the world's preeminent safe and liquid asset and that the American economy is fundamentally strong. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Anne-Marie, our chief Washington correspondent out of Washington, D.C. AMH, how did this one go down? Well, this one is going down differently depending on who you ask. Of course, Jonathan, the Republicans are going to point to Bidenomics and saying that this president and the legislative agenda he's been on has just add, added more money to the market that and has increased inflation. And it was on Bidenomics that now you have this downgrade. And then, of course, Democrats are going to show the brinkmanship and the chaos, frankly, that sometimes happens on Capitol Hill. And that is something with, interesting about this Fitch downgrade. It comes after they were able to come to a consensus on raising the debt ceiling. But obviously what Fitch is looking at in Washington is that there's not a lot of consensus about appropriations. And potentially in the next few months, we could see a government shutdown. And what Fitch seems to be uh, evoking here is what a lot of journalists and Americans see all the time is that there's these constant 11 hour deals that are being done in Washington and it's just not important for the fiscal health of the United States. They reference that directly in the lead quote from Fitch yesterday. The governance issues relative to AA and AAA rated peers over the last two decades has manifested in repeated debt limit standoffs and last minute resolutions. Anne-Marie, is there any reason to believe those last minute standoffs end anytime soon? 
Absolutely not. I would certainly not hold your breath on this one. This happens time and time again. Remember when S&P downgraded the United States in 2011, they actually also did reach an agreement on the debt ceiling, yet they were still ground, uh, downgraded. It's because this brinkmanship is the concern, even though Fitch did point to what the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is trying to uh, get across to the American people is that the U.S. at this moment has great momentum and economic health. But it does seem that Fitch is incredibly concerned with this brinkmanship in Washington, which honestly, going into an election year, is just going to get much worse. So all of the comments that I've read have basically been saying this doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to markets. It doesn't matter to politics. It doesn't matter to a lot of people who are just shrugging off Fitch and saying, why are you doing this? On the other hand, the U.S. interest rate payments have basically increased by about 50 percent over the past year to nearly a trillion dollars a year. You're looking at the likelihood of increased default risk just based on this brinkmanship alone. Is there anyone in Washington, D.C., who does care, who does not necessarily agree with Janet Yellen and thinks that this is a big deal. Well, the Republicans certainly do, and I'm sure we're going to hear from a lot more of them as the weeks go on. The, the issue they have politically with this downgrade, yes, a lot of people are shrugging it off. The Treasury Secretary is calling it arbitrary. Others seem to be puzzled, like Mohammed el because the timing and why this is happening when the data looks good. The fact of the matter is, now this president, the Biden administration, will own a downgrade on their watch. So this headline will now be used in every campaign ad, depending on who he is up against, in 2024. And we know that time and time again, the economy consistently ranks top of Americans' mind when they head to the polling box. AMH down in Washington. Anne-Marie, we'll catch up with you in the next hour. There's a lot to talk about over in Washington, D.C. at the moment. We talked about the governance issues being totally inconsistent with peers who are rated AAA by the likes of Fitch and others. Also, the debt burden. Totally inconsistent with peers elsewhere as well. The US debt burden is set to reach around about 120% of GDP by 2025. If you take the median, take the median right now of others in the AAA bucket, the median's 39%. At least it's night and day. Just the difference is totally night and day. Especially at a time of raising interest rates. I mean, that's the key, is that the rapid pace that the uh, financing expenses are increasing is going to raise some eyeballs, especially today when we get some sort of refinancing plan from the Treasury Department. They release just how much they're going to be borrowing, and we can extrapolate out what the likely expenses. That said, what do people do? They buy Treasuries. Exactly. That is the haven trade. And you have resilience and you have robust growth that is outpacing some of the other nations that have much smaller debt loads. That's why we have this visceral reaction to this stuff. There is this belief that the American economy, the U.S. debt market, has this special place in our market universe. It is the sun. And everyone else is just the planets that orbit that sun. And for that reason, this should always be AAA. You can't replace treasuries with anything else. There is nothing else out there. And for a lot of people, the U.S. is never going to default. So why wouldn't it be anything other than AAA? That's why you get that emotional response by a lot of people in markets. And a lot of people who are fund managers came out overnight and they basically said, are we actually going to adjust anything in our portfolio because of this? Nope, not, not a chance. And frankly, the rating agencies haven't exactly uh, bolstered their credibility over the past, mm, you know, 20 years. Terry Haynes joins us now, founder of Pangea Policy. Terry, we've seen one of these before a little more than a decade ago. Terry, you witnessed that as well. We all did. Can you tell me, first of all, whether it's justified and then we can get into whether it matters? Well, look, I think uh, I think a lot of the issues that both you and Lisa have brought up are entirely valid about uh, about interest, uh, in interest payments and all the rest. Uh, so let me just start there. Uh, secondly, you know, politically, I think it is bad news for Biden, as Anne Marie has talked about. Uh, thirdly, uh, I questioned uh, Fitch across the board, and particularly the timing. You know, Fitch is is older than the debt ceiling law. Uh, they were founded three years before the first uh, debt ceiling law happened. And, you know, now they're bestirring themselves uh, to complain about the process th through which uh, the United States uh, appropriates money and uh, and deals with its debt. Uh, so, you know, whatever else is going on here, uh, you know, I think there's a, uh, a motivation that's a little less pure than a lot of people would uh, want to talk about. Uh, and finally, you know, the economists, uh, you know, a lot of the same people 
people that are complaining about Fitch uh, are the same people that were, were entirely silent through uh, uh, through the whole money printing and uh, and fiscal bloat uh, era. And I think they're a little bit more concerned that that might be ending uh, for good. So, uh, you know, so I, I think uh, overall this isn't going to be uh, worth very much. That said, there is a real concern over just how much the budget is ballooning in terms of debt versus GDP, how much interest rate expenses are going up. I mean, to me, the idea that it went from about $600 billion to nearly a trillion dollars in a year is pretty shocking, yep. given the fact that interest rates have been going up. Terry, from your perspective, when you take a look at some of the plans, the economic plans that are coming out of the Republicans and the Democrats, is anyone seriously talking about remedying this or bringing in costs that could potentially cut benefits? No, they haven't talked about it, and they won't talk. They haven't talked about it for decades, and they won't talk about it. You know, the the, the good news and the concerning news uh, every year when uh, when spending is fixed uh, is really the same thing. Uh, the Firstly, uh, you know, on book spending uh, tends to be more or less status quo with some minor adjustments. Uh, you know, but the off book obligations, uh, whether it's uh, student loan debt or housing or anything else, are uh, are are humongous, and uh, and that's never dealt with uh, in in any sort of way, uh, and it's not going to be. Uh, you know, there, there's no percentage. Uh, for any of these politicians to want to take it on. There's no percentage for the White House to want to address it forthrightly and explain uh, to, to the public why it's a bad thing, why it amounts to a tax on them, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that situation won't change. Uh, you know, that that's properly identified. I question kind of the timing and the why. You said that this would be politically damaging to uh, President Biden heading into the 2024 election. And this comes at a time of an indictment of uh, former President Trump. And I'm wondering, a lot of people thinking that a, a runoff between Trump and Biden, a sort of repeat of what we saw in 2020, would necessarily end up with Biden winning. Are you starting to question that? Oh, I've, I've never thought uh, uh, Biden was a shoe in or anything of the kind, and I, and I still don't today. Uh, you can go back a few months and see that, uh, uh, and I think I did this on your air once, where, where the, about two or three months ago, where, uh, you know, you could look at different, uh, different national polling uh, and see that uh, Trump was either beating Biden or was, r was running essentially neck and neck with him. Uh, you know, that... That's still true. Uh, you know, kind of what the indictments for me uh, mean is that markets have a lot less certainty about what the outcome is going to be. So I think there's going to be a lot more trepidation and this kind of uh, this kind of motors on for a while as a as a silent market negative. Terry, there's a sense that we've lost sight of how serious some of these illegal issues actually are. A sense of fatigue, I think, for a lot of people in this country. Terry, just to go through some of the federal charges, conspiracy to defraud the United States. Conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. Obstruction of an attempt to obstruct an official proceeding. Again and again and again, these things come up, Terry. And people in this country, many of them, shrugging their shoulders towards that, Terry. Just how serious are some of these charges? Oh, I think the charges are quite serious. Uh, I think their provability is very difficult. And, and, and I'll get to that in a second. But let me just say off the top, you know, you've got... The world, the world those people are living in now, or, world, or the world where uh, you know Trump is indicted. As my daughter says, it's a day that ends in Y. So isn't there another Trump indictment? Firstly, secondly, you've got a a, a slurge in the in the Biden matter where uh, we've now moved into a situation where uh, Biden seems to have been involved in his son's business, uh, which is directly contradictory to what he's been saying for years. Uh, that's going to be a problem. We're just at the beginning of that. And thirdly, you've got a situation, you know, with this uh, with this prosecution itself, where the the, the indictment uh, concedes that uh, Trump has a right, like every American, I'm quoting, to speak publicly about the election and even to claim falsely that there had been outcome determinative fraud. Uh, but now we're going to start prosecuting based on what he did about that. Uh, he's gonna, the, the prosecutor is going to have to establish motivation, and it almost seems to me like a. Uh, a few good men kind of uh, code red uh, uh, examination, cross-examination. You're going to have to get the state of mind at a time where you know that the White House had different advisors telling the president different yeah. things. How do you get to the bottom of that? Uh, very difficult. Terry, what are 24 hours in Washington, D.C.? Terry Haynes of Pangea. Terry, thank you. Equities down here by 0.7%. Bob Michael at J.P. Morgan coming up a little bit later. Live from New York City. Good morning.
this is a little bit surprising, probably more in the timing than the actual uh, downgrade. I think this will be used as a political cudgel uh, against the Democrats and particularly against the president going into this election cycle. Absolutely. I mean, we are already seeing kind of the politics of austerity, if you will, kind of creep back into the kind of the zeitgeist. But again, does this all really matter in the kind of the, the market landscape? You know, probably, probably not so much. There is a feeling this morning that the political fallout will be larger than the market fallout. That was Libby Cantrell, PIMCO's head of U.S. public policy. Just as the headline dropped across the Bloomberg terminal yesterday afternoon after the close, the United States stripped of its AAA rating, this time by Fitch, more than a decade after S&P Global Ratings. Here's the market fallout. I have to say it's pretty muted stuff relative to the gains that we've had in this market year to date. We're down by 0.7% on S&P 500 futures. The bond market... Would you know, would you have a clue that anything has happened based on this move this morning? The 10-year, 4.02%. The move was yesterday, Lisa, at the long end of the curve yes. as we started to get a sense of just how large the deficit and the refunding and the bond issuance that we're going to get from Treasury might have to be this quarter. And that, to me, is the real story. And the Fitch uh, noise is going to be a political cudgel, as uh, we heard from Libby Contrill. But we're looking at a real situation where the U.S. has to refinance trillions of dollars of debt at a time where its interest rate expenses are surging. At what point does this become a real problem for Congress and, frankly, for presidential candidates that are not proposing to cut Social Security or other things that would be just basically dead-in-the-water types of political views? If you you missed it. Here are the numbers. So this came just before the downgrade. The Treasury Department set to increase its net borrowing estimate for the July through September quarter, so this quarter, to $1 trillion. That's up from $733 billion that it had predicted back in early May and is much, much larger than a lot of people thought as well. And Lisa, we're going to find out a little bit later, right, just where on the curve some of that issuance is going to land. 8.30 a.m. we get that announcement and we're going to work through it with Michael McKee. How much will that push up long-end yields, which moved to the highest levels in years. I mean, this to me is really important to focus on, given the fact that everyone's talking about interest rate expenses coming back down, inflation coming back in, normalization. What does normal look like in a very different interest rate expense uh, environment and one where this government keeps borrowing more and more money? We've got a fantastic lineup of guests to dig through some of the political fallout and the market fallout as well. Let's get to Chris Verone, partner and head of technical macro strategy at Strategus, a bad company. Chris joins us around a table in New York. Chris, good morning. Great to be here. Lots going on. Not a quiet summer, that's for no, sure. Not a quiet start to August. We've talked about whether it's justified. Let's talk about the market fallout. Does it matter? You know, I was thinking about this last night, the differences between this downgrade yesterday and it was actually, I think, August 5th of 2011 was the downgrade. The yield setup was actually very different. Yields were falling into the 2011 downgrade. Yields were in a downtrend. We kind of have a saying, surprises always break in the direction of the trend. And the trend in yield is up right now. I understand the reaction the last 12 hours is relatively muted, but you've had a ripper in rates over the last couple of weeks here. And I love a good paradox, and I think the market likes one as well. And you go back to the 3% CPI print on July 12th, you know, yields traded all the way down to 370. They've made up that whole move back. They were 395 before the CPI. They're 402 this morning. 30-year yields have really moved uh, here also. So I think the surprise here ultimately will still be yields up in the direction of the trend. The market backdrop, the economic backdrop yeah. back in 2011, I remember the conversations we were having back in London at the time. We had the Eurozone debt crisis on our doorstep. Yeah. It was just totally, totally different. But there was a conversation. I remember Bill Blaine being on the phone with me at the time. I think he was with New Edge going years and years yeah. back. And he said, John, if they get downgraded from AAA to AA, it won't be treasuries that people sell. It will be other stuff to make space for treasuries. Is that dynamic kind of in play this morning? You know, I'm, I remember getting the 2011 call wrong. I was in the camp that a, a downgrade would mean higher yields back then. And I want to make sure this time around the recency bias of that experience doesn't change how I interpret this. So I, I really do think this time around it does mean yields up here. Uh, I would also emphasize, remember, that led to an easier central bank or an easy monetary policy response. You had Jackson Hole that soon followed in August uh, of 11. You got, I think, QE2 or QE3 that came out of that. I don't think that's going to be the monetary policy response from this. And, you know, you speak of all the things since that 3% CPI print a couple weeks ago. I mean, commodities have ripped here as well, right? So you have commodities up and you have rates up. And I think generally you have complacency around the equity market here after a very strong start to the year. I just would want to watch my back.
Can you imagine if at Jackson Hole, Jay Powell comes out and he's like, I would like to talk about the Fitch uh, downgrade to the United States somehow. It's just a different time. It yes, is. I it's would a agree. It's a different time with it different is. qualifications. That said, I am wondering whether you do expect going forward, and we were talking about some of the political risk, and we were just talking with Terry Haynes, who said he does expect this to start getting priced in a little bit more with a move away from certain U.S. assets, given some of the uncertainty around the political backdrop. Do you buy that argument? Is that one of the reasons why you see yields going higher? I think at the end of the day, it's still a question of where you go. You know, what's the alternative? The dollar response has been fairly muted here over the last 12 hours uh, or so as well. Um, I do think it's interesting. Gold did rally. Bitcoin has rallied here a little bit as well. So maybe there's some alternatives there. But if there's another difference maybe from the 2011 experience versus today, and you look at the Chinese and you look at the Japanese, they're big net sellers of treasuries here. And they've been big net sellers of treasuries for the last year. That was not the case kind of in that 2010. 2011 period. So there's a lot of different dynamics where I'm almost hesitant to compare this incident with the 2011 incident. I think they're very different. I think the outcome will ultimately be different as well. You were talking about yields ripping, and yeah. we've been talking for the past couple of months how it seems like risk assets are not noticing. They mm. don't seem to care this time. <laughs> Is this a sort of reset moment? not just because of Fitch, not because of the political backdrop and legal cases, but because people are kind of getting a little uncomfortable here and are starting to wonder whether this yield space is mm. going to create something more significant. You know, I was thinking about this a few weeks ago. When you look at how strong the first half of the year was, it's really, really only rivaled by a couple other years in history. 95, the first half of the year, was very, very strong. 98, um, and actually 87. And when you look at 95 and 98, the strength continued in the second half because bond yields kept falling. So equities rose, bond yields kept falling. 87, we know, is the opposite, right? Bond yields rip in the summer of 87. And you get this very um, uncomfortable setup where yields are up and equities are up. And we know what happens then in the fall of 87. I'm not saying that's what's happening here. But I do find it curious when you get yields up big and stocks up big, something tends to become unsettled very quickly. Is that technical, though? highly technical or is it somehow linked to fundamentals is some kind of better outlook on the cycle some cyclical yeah. impulse kicking in which one is it it's a great question john and you know here's how i kind of try to answer that or put those puzzle pieces together when rates are rising and cyclicality is still outperforming I think it's a message that the market's comfortable, that the message in yields means economic activity is still relatively robust. When I see defensives outperforming, even as yields go up, that's a different message. That's the message, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Yields are telling us something's about to change here. Fortunately, we don't have that yet. I mean, cyclicality is largely still leadership here. You see it with semis, you see it with transports, but that's what I want to be on guard for here because yields up with defensives working is not a very... Uh, compatible combination. It's a kind of strange moment that we're seeing this yeah. commodity story, this bond market story, with China clearly struggling to find some growth. How do you reconcile those two things? Yeah, it's uh, you tell me. I don't know. I, we're we're trying to put these pieces of the puzzle together, and we put out a list last week. It was 13 signs commodities are reinflecting, and everything from oil back above the 200-day for the first time in a year. I mean, the breakout in the copper stocks has been compelling. The breakout in the steel stocks has been compelling, and again, it's a kind of this paradox that it's all happened basically since the 3% CPI print in early July, also coincident with Janet Yellen's trip to China. So you kind of wonder what what deal may be well, brokered, right? Deep, yeah. deep into yeah. the conspiracy. Yeah, right? Seriously, I was about to say. I mean, you look at the response <laughs> from the commodities morning. here. Um, yeah. They're acting like the, the Chinese are going to put their foot on the pedal. Um, I, I, I thought copper, you know, back up to this 390 neighborhood is important. And I thought the move in crude is a change. OK. I think this is a conversation for commercial break. Chris, thank you. Thank you. Chris Veronis to see us. Chris, it's good to see you. Equities right now down about three quarters of one percent on the S&P 500. Later on this morning, we'll get an ADP jobs report, pushing ahead to payrolls on Friday and plenty more on this downgrade from Fitch on the U.S. credit rating. John Reidig, the chief economic advisor at Bring Capital, coming up. Good morning. 
What a 12 hours. Equities right now on the S&P negative by 0.7% on the S&P 500. Following that downgrade, we're negative by 1% on the Nasdaq. Tomorrow after the close, a big day for the Nasdaq 100. Apple and Amazon just around the corner. In a bond market, first place I looked after that downgrade, yields totally unchanged on a 10-year, 4.02%. There was this shift higher in longer-dated yields. We can talk about the Treasury refunding still to come. The 30-year right now at 4.1%. The two-year yields just a little bit lower here. We're down by three or four basis points. I don't think you can make too much of that. 486 21 going into the ADP jobs report a little bit later on this morning that comes at 8 15 eastern time so one hour and 45 minutes to finish in foreign exchange but again strength out there maybe sort of speaking to that risk off move some euro weakness just a touch we're negative by 0.1 percent euro dollar at 109 73. Under surveillance this morning, then, Fitch rating stripping the U.S. of its top-tier sovereign credit rating, cutting it from AAA to AA+, plus, and a statement writing this. Fitch saying the rating downgrade of the United States reflects the expected fiscal deterioration over the next three years, a high and growing general government debt burden, and the erosion of governance. I think this is the issue here, Lisa, this line here. The erosion of governance relative to AA and AAA rated peers over the last two decades. It's hard to argue against that last line. We were just worrying about whether the U.S. would default on its debts just a couple of months ago, and it was a really real risk simply because of political gridlock down in Washington, D.C. We don't get that from other countries. That said, even at that time, what would the response be to a default? Probably buy more treasuries, because it was just viewed as political gridlock, exactly what it was. So there's a sort of odd dissonance right now to markets being like, Guys, just quit it. We all know that treasuries are fine and the economy is good. And then you've got the political reputation where there is some sort of risk and feeling of instability that Fitch is reflecting. You mentioned a pushback from the administration, Secretary Yellen calling the move both arbitrary and outdated. Some high profile economists piling on Fitch as well. Mohamed Al Arian, a good friend of this program, good friend of ours, writing this. The vast majority of economists and market analysts looking at this are likely to be equally perplexed by the reasons cited and the timing. Overall, this announcement is much more likely to be dismissed than have a lasting disruptive impact on the US economy and on markets too. Larry Summers, you mentioned this line a little bit earlier, Lisa. The idea that this is creating the risk of a default on the US Treasury market is absurd, and I don't think that Fitch has any new and useful insights into the situation. It's telling that you talk about this, we talk about this right after you mentioned euro weakness versus the dollar. The response in markets emphasizes, underscores what we're hearing from Larry Summers, from Mohamed Alarian, from Janet Yellen, which is we don't care. And if anything, in a moment of instability, we will go into U.S. assets. That said, longer term, and we have heard this from a lot of people questioning the dollar's dominance, and a lot of people have gotten that wrong many times again and again. But there is a question of longer term consequences of just the debt borrowing, what we're going to get at 8.30, that I think are real and are going to be really important issues for the These future. conversations are precisely the same ones we had more than 10 years ago. Yes. And if you draw a line in the sand, I think it was August 5th, mm. back in August 2011, take the dollar index, have a look at what it's done since then to now. It's up something like 40%. 40%, and we had exactly the same conversations more than a decade ago. The growth profile right now, of course, and this is just an observation about the past and where we are. It's not about where I think we're going. But the growth conversation now is so much better to the growth conversation we had back then. Mike Gapen of Bank of America capturing that, and I just wanted to bring you this quote, the head of US economics over at Bank of America saying this, recent incoming data has made us reassess our prior view that a mild recession in 24 is the most likely outcome. Growth in economic activity over the past three quarters has averaged 2.3%. The unemployment rate has remained near all-time lows, and wage and price pressures are moving in the right direction, albeit gradually. They're dropping their recession call, Lisa. Who isn't dropping the recession call? I saw this, and it's just pretty much one after another, dropping recession call, upgrading expectations for risk assets and what they're going to return. At a time when more people are leading into the soft landing kind of narrative, I do wonder whether people are feeling like maybe they've gotten over their skis. A couple of recent hints on the consumer spending side, a couple of recent earnings reports raising some issues on that. I think about Starbucks, for example. I'm not saying that, you know, Frappuccino is going to really make a break the U.S. economy. But my point is, you are seeing some pushback on the margins in a couple of different sectors, and you do wonder whether it does actually mean that there is weakness. It's odd yesterday, just going through the earnings, and this is always my my issue with earnings sometimes. You can pick a company and tell whatever story you like. Yes. Starbucks is one. Let's take JetBlue. So JetBlue's telling us the domestic economy isn't as good as you think, and Caterpillar's telling us the international economy is not as bad as you think. 
Can you make sense of that from those two names? Well, and, but this is actually the most interesting part because this is what a lot of people have been calling a manufacturing resurgence, which Caterpillar perhaps points to and the rally that we've seen in oil prices points to. At the same time, the consumers get more discretionary. Maybe they don't want a Frappuccino, but maybe they want to go and stay in a hotel, a luxury hotel, and swim in the pool. I mean, these are the kinds of things. It's not like anyone's crying for them, but my point is you're seeing some real gangbusters kinds of earnings from the hotels, from other airlines that are international. Yeah. Are people just kind of shifting their money slowly in a way that's going to have significant ramifications. It's a confusing market. When you look at the earnings, it doesn't really help. TK is poolside this morning, I'm told. <laughs> he may or may not join us tomorrow. Without a Frappuccino. Going into payrolls. Without a Frappuccino, of course. Something much stronger than that. I've talked a lot about <laughs> our lineup this morning. On the bond market, you'll hear from Robert Tipp of PGM, Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management through the next couple of hours. On the politics, the political fallout down in Washington, D.C., Henrietta Trace of Vader Partners will be joining us in about 25 minutes. Joining us now is a man who's seen it all. John Reining, Chief Economic Advisor at Bring Capital and a former Economic Advisor to the Bank of England. John, good morning to you. Good morning. What did you make of that one yesterday afternoon? Uh, what are we talking about here? The, the downgrade, not the, the indictment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it, it seems 12 years out of sync. I agree with the comments of both Summers and El Arian. I mean, there's no particular news to spare. We know the fiscal trends in the U.S. Uh, have been bad and will continue to be bad, as uh, signaled uh, by you know, the outlook from the CBO. So I don't, I don't, we got through a terrible political um, battle over the uh, debt ceiling, and somehow uh, we got through that. So, but, but, but in the end, it's the U.S. Treasury, and uh, you know, p do, p I don't think people buy U U.S. Treasuries because of a rating of, of some rating issues. There may be technical issues for some people, what they can and what they can't own in certain structures, but uh, um, I, I think it's just uh, it's a bit of a head scratcher while recognizing all the bad things that they're saying, including the questions about uh, uh, you know the breakdown in governance. It reignites the same conversations. We all understand how privileged the U.S. Treasury market is and how privileged the U.S. government is to issue that debt. The question still remains, are we abusing that privilege? Would you agree that we are? Well, I think the U.S. has abused the privilege. And I think they abused the privilege, that the more important one, the, the privilege of seniorage of the uh, uh, print of the currency. And so much of the currency is held internationally and, and, and you know, in an era of digital assets and so on, it, it's amazing how rapidly uh, the growth of uh, paper money uh, has expanded. And most of that is crated up and, and shipped out of the U.S. and circulates overseas. Um, but in, in terms of that, and, and at least you just made reference to it, but there really is no viable alternative for a long time. Uh, for the U.S. dollar in terms of its uh, role in international finances. So, again, a, a, a change in a rating by a debt agency isn't, isn't going to change very much. Sure, and we can question the relevance of Fitch and question the political uh, implications of it, as Terry Haynes was raising some questions around how uh, pure the motives were of this rating agency. However, there are some real issues going on, and they'll be highlighted in about two hours' time when we get the refinancing agreement, uh, or we get the refinancing plan by the U.S. Treasury, expected to be more than $200 billion more for this quarter than people previously thought at a time when interest expenses are surging. Does that not matter? Oh, I, 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 think, it, I think it does matter. Um, you know, the U.S., in terms of its responses during the COVID period, what it did in March of 2020 was absolutely needed. But the, the fiscal actions that were taken in um, you know late uh, 2021 when we and um, you know Larry Summers and others were doing calculations to say hey you know this is just too big a fiscal stimulus uh, for the US economy um, and you know long-term issues uh, you, I think you made mention I think I heard you saying about you know not cutting social security I mean that's the you know that, that that's the third rail. That's that's never going to be touched, especially in a uh, in an era where um, you know demographics are getting older. So voters are getting uh, more entrenched in terms of of receiving social security. The opportunity to reform that um, change you know, disappeared uh, in the early two thousands when the Bush administration considered creating private ownership 
uh, as the president told me, not privatization, private ownership of um, uh, of Social Security, uh, and that died a, that died a death. So the, the, those terrible fiscal trends are, are going to remain in place. As an economist, though, there is a question of at what point do interest rates become unsustainable and unsustainably high based on the debt load that we have? And I ask this because of the response of 30-year Treasuries yesterday to the debt issuance, not to the Fitch uh, rating cut. And I'm wondering at what point, at what profile, does this become a real negative concern for the creditworthiness of the United States? Well, well, well let's take some rough numbers. We've got a, a debt-to-GDP ratio right now of around 100 percent, and we've got a 10-year Treasury of 4 percent. So if we assume that, that 4 percent was the um, uh, was the number of, in terms of interest rates, the thing about financing, that means you've got four percent of GDP each year to pay the interest on the debt. Um, now, in an economy, let, let's if we get back to 2% inflation, and it's going to be a while before we get there, and let's say underlying growth is 2%. That's roughly equivalent to being able to sustain a 100% debt-to-GDP ratio. The problem in that, as you do that, is the interest payments, to, to keep that stable, have to squeeze out other spending. And that's the problem. The interest payments will get bigger. And if there's no counterbalancing reduction elsewhere, then those fiscal ratios continue to deteriorate. Now, if we end up in a 5% interest rate world, which I don't think we will for the long haul, but if we do, then the debt numbers start to become problematic. And then you'll have people saying, and this is one of the, the, the troubling things, say, well, the U.S. will inflate its way out of the debt. Well, the Fed won't let the U.S. inflate its way out of debt. Yes, the Fed made some terrible mistakes back in uh, 2021, continuing to ease by purchasing $120 billion of debt per month as inflation picked up. But you've got to remember, on top of that, that fiscal trend, the Fed is essentially um, selling. It's not actually selling, but by not reinvesting, it's forcing the Treasury to issue more debt to, to the marketplace. So the debt trends are sort of worse than the fiscal trends because of the uh, Fed getting out of the quantitative easing game. This is a political question, so forgive me. Any reason to believe that politicians in Washington somehow embrace austerity anytime soon? Uh, I, I, I don't think so. Um, I, you know, the... Uh, it, it, there, there's just, just such a dysfunctionality uh, in uh, Washington, D.C., and with coming into, um, you know, the election uh, process next year uh, and with divided government between uh, the Senate uh, and the administration on the one hand um, and the House on the other, uh, I, I don't see there being any kind of a sensible uh, reform package um, out there, and you do have the the, the potential for these um, uh, the, these these battles that give you a problem the next time the the debt ceiling comes around. Unfortunately, that's been kicked down the road for a little while. But you know, it's just just as a mechanism, it's just really weird that you authorize the spending. And then you have a second thing saying, well, you've spent it, you've run up the credit card bill. Oh, but you're not authorized to pay the credit card bill. We, we, it was okay to spend it, <laughs> but it's, 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 it's not okay to, 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 to pay it. I, mean, I don't mean the it's US kind to pay of off odd. the debt, but that's it's the analogy. Kind of odd. I agree with you. I agree. Every time this comes up, it's kind of odd. It's, it's bizarre. It's bizarre. And you're not raising the debt limit for spending already agreed and already spent in many, in many cases. It's, it's kind of odd. John, thank you. John Rydick of Bring Capital. John, appreciate it. What a situation. Here we go again, somehow desensitised by the events of more than a decade ago. There's just a shrug of the shoulders this morning, Lisa. Is it justified? Divided opinion on that. Does it matter? I think the consensus is doesn't matter that much, at least not this morning. Desensitised is the word of the day, I will say, to a lot of things, and that seems to be a trend. Does it change anything for PGM? Robert Tip of PGM Fixed Income up next from New York. This is Bloomberg. I disagree with Secretary Treasury Yellen's notion that this was arbitrary. It wasn't arbitrary. The U.S. has is the strongest growth. It is able to service its debt. Um, investors around the world shouldn't be concerned at all. It'll be after we get over this initial market response, um, um, it'll be back to normal. 
The Treasury market is in a class of its own. The words of Bloomberg Intelligence and Ira Jersey this morning. That, by the way, was Mickey Levy, the Berenberg Capital Market's chief economist. has stirred plenty of debate and a collective shrug of the shoulders in the market in many cases, particularly in bonds without much movement whatsoever in Treasuries. This is what Fitch is essentially saying. They're making three points here. That this downgrade of the United States reflects, one, the expected fiscal deterioration over the next three years. The second point, a high and growing general government debt burden. And the third point, which I just find impossible to disagree with, the erosion of governance relative to AA and AAA rated peers over the last two decades. Pick out those three points. Point three, Bramo, I find it really, really difficult to argue against point three. We were just talking about the potential for the U.S. government to default, not because of a wherewithal to pay, but simply because there was political gridlock in Washington, D.C. You say the third point is difficult to uh, disagree with. Well, all of them are difficult to disagree with. And this is the interesting thing. People have been talking about the increasing debt load relative to GDP and the interest expenses that are surging. I mean, really climbing rapidly on the heels of rate increases by the Federal Reserve. So you put this together. They're not wrong, but people still shrug their shoulders and say, you know what? This has been the story forever. The U.S. has a stronger economy than ever. Nothing has changed. Why did you do this? As we've said over the last 50 minutes or so, is it justified and does it matter? Two very different questions we have to grapple with this morning. Let's deal with the latter with Robert Tip, the chief investment strategist over at PGM Fixed Income. Robert, does that decision by Fitch, more than a decade after S&P Global Ratings did the same thing, change anything for you and the team this morning? No, not really. Uh, I mean, the United States is, is unrivaled in terms of having a, a market for government bonds that is liquid and secure, and that's going to remain the case for, for our generation. But it is interesting, and it does cause people to stop and pause and ask these questions, which they should ask. And in terms of the last 20 years, I would say there has been an erosion in terms of the U.S. and our governance relative to other countries. Take a look at the European uh, Union, for example. Uh, they have a stability and growth pact, which they flout, but it's on the sidelines and it is debated. So, you know, there is an acknowledgement that debt matters, that you want to be sustainable. And the United States has had a soaring debt. You know, it's not just a little bit, it's not a creep. It's from 40% debt to GDP to rocketing, you know, towards an over 100% in the last 20 years. And this was never the case. You know, in the last century, people would rack up debt and they would pay it down. Uh, and then people would wring their hands about the countries that ran 100 percent debt to GDP. I don't know if you recall the time in the Eurozone crisis, all of those analyses that 80 to 100 percent was the death zone for sovereign credits. Now nobody cares. Monetary finance is, is commonplace. Uh, and so having something like this, even though these were really vanity ratings from a practical perspective, it causes you to ask the questions because over 50 years, 100 years, eventually you do lose flexibility. But in terms of are we doing a trade on this? No. It is the independent assessment of America's credit worthiness on behalf of Fitch. And to some people, it matters. To others, it doesn't. Many people on this program, it doesn't seem to matter. Robert, I wonder if this matters to you. The Treasury Department coming out and essentially telling us that net borrowing, the estimate for July through September this quarter, it's going to be a trillion. It's not going to be the 733 that they thought it would be back in May. Does that additional supply change where you think this yield curve is going to develop into? Yeah, now we're talking, John. Yeah, the um, deficit had, had, some, uh, had some low prints uh, looking back several months, which were kind of surprising, given that actually, you know, nobody is trying to reduce the deficit anywhere, but especially here in the United States. So having uh, a few hundred extra billion hit the market, I think does matter. And what we're talking about is a little bit of an impact on the absolute level of rates. It puts a little bit of pressure there, but also puts pressure on relative rates. That's really the thing uh, to watch. Uh, you know, if you go back 30 years, treasuries used to trade rich to swap rates, as if there was a scarcity or a quality premium people would pay up for treasuries. Now, by the time you get to the back end of the curve, treasuries trade cheap, basically, to the Fed fund swap curve, to the SOFR curve, to uh, you know a, a riskless uh, alternative out there um, that doesn't have the supply pressures of the U.S. Treasury. So this definitely makes a difference in terms of relative spreads. And as these numbers continue to become more and more unbelievable, I mean, on a daily basis, the United States Treasury 
on a, a day when they're hitting the bill market, the coupon market, will do more than all other countries in the world combined. And that's a pretty stunning number. Robert, you were talking about how for a number of years we cared about 80 to 100 percent debt to GDP. Now no one cares. We have the U.S. with about 120 percent debt to GDP. Does that shift where people start to care again, given that rates are not zero anymore? In other words, are we in a new regime where interest rate pressures and expenses suddenly make this a top priority and make debt matter again from a fundamental perspective? Yeah, well, we're, we're not there right now. Uh, I mean, the, the U.K. used to be a place that had, uh, you know, a clear mindset on this. Now the places that have a mindset that are active or where you see it in the press are smaller countries, and it's incredibly limited. Uh, if you go back to, to the 90s, it was incredibly different. Uh, I differ with uh, uh, John Riding's take that the Fed will stop them. No central bank is stopping governments from issuing debt these days. If you go back to the 90s, even coming into this century, Greenspan had the nerve to speak out, say, this is my job, that's their job, but I'll tell you, in the abstract, there should be a long-term fiscal construct for controlling the amount of debt, and now that's gone. So, uh, and there were you know, technical things people may not be aware of. I mean, there was an effort to consciously balance the budget, which succeeded, uh, and by coming into the century, we were in surplus and we were on track to literally pay down the debt people were talking about. But things like PAYGO, various restrictions that actually kind of contained these deficits over time, those have all been scrapped. And, uh, you know, we need to get to that time where people look for uh, sustainability so that yeah. when you hit a crisis, you have the fiscal flexibility to react. Given the fact that there doesn't seem to be a lot of impetus in Washington to bring that under control or pay it back or have that ammunition, as you were saying, how high could long-term yields go? Right. So, you know, like I said, I think the fundamentals are driving the level of yields, and those are around current levels. I think if, if the expansion continues and it turns out that this drop in inflation we've seen here is transitory, you could get a little bit of an increase in rates you know, tens over 4%, but it's going to be more owing to the fundamentals uh, than to this technicality here. Uh, I think, though, that, you know, Fitch and on the governance side, you know, on the one hand, it's, it's interesting timing because in this last showdown, there was, you know, open talk uh, of those 13 words you could take from the 14th Amendment about the sanctity of the U.S. debt. And that was uplifting. But the fact of the matter is the politics, you know, ping pong, and you have lawmakers that are upset about an unfettered rise in the level of debt, and they can, uh, you know, really cause a lot of trouble uh, in that process. So I think it's it's noteworthy that Fitch brings this up, and it's worth keeping in front of people. Robert Tip of PGM Fixed Income. Robert, thanks for jumping on in front of the camera to give us your latest thoughts from PGM and what it means for this fixed income market. Nothing yet so far this morning, I think, is the general consensus. What is the alternative is a question that we're going to talk about repeatedly through this morning. The team here at Bloomberg getting a variety of sources on the phone, in front of a camera, emailing in, working out what on earth is going on. This is Pendle Group, OK? Allow me to share this quote with you. What would be the alternative? Euro govies, that's still a currency breakup accident waiting to happen because of a lack of fiscal unity. China, nobody wants to own that sovereign risk. Japan, the BOJ still owns half the market. It's a privileged position the US is in, that if you ask people this morning, what's the alternative? They can't find one. So basically, the United States is saved by the incompetence of other governments or basically the lack of conviction around uh, around the other nations and the idea that even if they're bad, they're not as bad. And so it's a relative game. The bottom line is that treasuries are so entrenched in the global financial system. The dollar is so entrenched in the global financial system that countries that try to move away struggle. And that has been a perennial issue, especially when, you know, people are talking about the weaponization of the dollar, uh, certainly during Russia and some of the other things. This is going to be an ongoing question. When does it matter? It's going to be a key one also. It is the sun in our market universe and has been for a long, long time. Henry de Trey's of Vader Partners on the political fallout down in Washington, D.C. Coming up shortly, we'll touch base with Anne-Marie. Looking forward to that conversation down in Washington. We'll speak to Brian Weinstein of Morgan Stanley Investment Management on the bond market. He's coming into the studio here in New York. And we'll speak to RBC's Amy Wu Silverman. All of that in the next hour on Bloomberg.
I sympathize with the analysts at Fitch and take my hats off to them for doing this when it's not a moment of brinksmanship. Clearly it's not good news, but if we look at the initial market reaction, pretty moderate reaction in the bond market. No country that has the strength of the U.S. is going to be affected. The main question is, does this compromise the reserve currency status yes. of the U.S. dollar? I have learned very painfully that one never wants to forecast the demise of the dollar. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. I cannot tell you how many messages I've had this morning, emails that start with something like, nobody cares about Fitch. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow, reacting to the news yesterday afternoon after the close that Fitch, more than a decade later, joined S&P Global Rating, stripping the United States of its AAA rating and making three points. The downgrade of the US reflects the expected fiscal deterioration, a high and growing general government debt burden, and this line, Lisa, which we've talked about all morning on Bloomberg TV and radio, the erosion of governance in Washington, D.C. Fitch originally came out flagging that they may downgrade the U.S. in May during the height of the brinksmanship that we saw down in Washington, D.C. He's now uh, coming out, Fitch is now coming out and saying, you know what, we're going to go ahead with it, even though you guys did resolve it. And this comes at a time when there are some real issues that are affecting markets, which include how big the debt is getting and how high the interest expenses are going. So you did see that reaction in markets yesterday. So it is important to flag this, even if no one cares about Fitch, which is what I've gotten as well. I've gotten all the emails. Don't bet against America. I've gotten those too. And I, I hear you. And I think that the issue is that they do raise some real points. Is it justified? You can make the case it's justified. Does it matter? Let's let the market speak for itself. Equities recovering, the S&P 500. Futures are negative now by just 0.4% on the S&P. We were down a whole lot more than that a couple of hours ago. In the bond market, yields are down by almost a basis point, Lisa, on a 10-year, 4.01%, and the dollar is a little bit stronger against the euro. The move, though, did come yesterday when we did see that 30-year Treasury yield go up on the heels of this feeling that the Treasury would be borrowing a lot more money than it previously had expected. Just to give you a sense of what we're looking at, today. 8.15 a.m. we get you know, a sense of the employment market with the ADP employment report, which we've always said no one cares about until they do. This comes after jolts. Uh, the job openings fell to the lowest going back to April 2021 yesterday. So you are seeing a deceleration here. And whether it is orderly and a soft landing type of deceleration or not is something we're trying to parse through. 8.30 a.m. This may be the most important issue of the day. The Treasury is releasing a refunding policy statement where they're expected to say they're going to borrow, as you've mentioned, a uh, trillion dollars in the third quarter. $274 billion more than initially expected. This was what caused the 30-year Treasury to surge yesterday. This is what people are looking at when they look at interest rate expenses that have ballooned by 50 percent in just a year to nearly a trillion dollars. And then uh, what we get after the bell, Qualcomm, TripAdvisor, Zillow, Etsy, Coca-Cola, uh, hotels uh, and MGM resorts. A lot of earnings as we take a look at incredible gains, particularly with some of the less loved stocks of the last year. What does this tell us about the economy? What does this tell us about the strength of the U.S. Uh, that people are pointing to that should just absolutely eradicate any concerns about political drama, right? Do we see ongoing sense that people still want to go to all sorts of hotels and gamble and buy homes? And even if the mortgage rate's high, it doesn't matter. And Qualcomm is going to be coming up with chips. I mean, this is the U.S. dynamism that people are talking about. Double-digit gains. I'm pleased you brought up the Treasury refunding announcement, 8.30 Eastern time. On the same day, the Treasury Department increased its net borrowing estimate for the current quarter to $1 trillion from $733 billion. You've got the likes of Secretary Yellen calling the move to downgrade the country arbitrary and outdated. Let me share the quote with you. This decision does not change what Americans, investors and people all around the world already know. The Treasury securities remain the world's preeminent safe and liquid asset and that the American economy is fundamentally strong. Now, fundamentally strong, that backs up the amount of people who have dropped their recession call over the last few weeks. I get it. The timing of this feels really, really weird. But on the same day, they've had to increase their net borrowing estimate by as much as they've had to. Lisa, is it really arbitrary and outdated to bring up these issues again? I don't think it is. Especially if we're not supposedly bailing out an economy, right, that's in distress, which was the point that we've been hearing about. Where is the ammunition to do that? And this is some of the uh, sort of push-pull as we try to dismiss this 
as just, ugh, Fitch, what are you thinking? You're just going to be dragged under the mud, just like S&P lost a lot of credibility, just like Moody's, all of the rating agencies. After 2008, they all lost a ton of credibility, and yet they do point out things that are having real market implications, particularly yesterday with the refinancing agreement. Wall Street saying there's a chorus, you know, right now we don't care about Fitch. I think the rest of the country... What's Fitch? Anne-Marie joined us now, Bloomberg Washington correspondent. AMH, the market fallout this morning is limited. The political fallout is pretty loud. Can you walk us through the blame game currently in the nation's capital? Well, we had Libby Cantrell of PIMCO on yesterday as this was breaking, and she was talking about the fact that this is just going to be used as the latest political cudgel against the Democrats and against the Biden administration. So what you already see Republicans talking about is they're blaming Bidenomics for this. But let me give you a little bit of taste of what the Biden campaign is blaming. They say this is a Trump downgrade. It's a direct result of an extreme MAGA Republican agenda defined by chaos, callousness, and recklessness that Americans continue to reject. So, Jonathan, this is going to be used as the latest economic weapon both parties want to use against each other. But the bottom line is it happened while Biden is in the White House. So Republicans are going to use this in November of 2024 when you know that Americans are concerned about the economy. We just saw this latest national poll from The New York Times and Siena. Number of interesting tidbits from this poll, especially given the fact that you do see Trump just dominating his Republican field. You also see it likely is going to be a Trump-Biden uh, matchup that could be very close if it is those two individuals. They look neck and neck. But then if you look into more questions of the poll, how do you feel about the U.S. economy right now? Do you think it's doing well? Only 2 percent said exceptional. 49% said poor. So the economy still rates as a top issue for American voters, and this doesn't bode well for this sitting president. We've got to talk about some legal issues as well, so stay close, Anne-Marie. We'll catch up with you in a couple of minutes' time. I want to bring in Henrietta Trace into the conversation, Economic Policy Research Director of Veda Partners. Henrietta, first of all, just your initial reaction to that move yesterday evening from Fitch. Uh, my first reaction as somebody who was a staffer at the time on the Senate side is you have got to be kidding me. This is not going to be well received. Um, but the first thing I wanted to get across to our clients was effectively Congress is not going to like this. This is not going to be something that members say, oh, look, I was right. This is a great time for me to have this conversation. I'd also like to push back just a little bit on the narrative that President Biden is going to be the one that is blamed here. Um, as folks from 2011 will recall, the uh, then House Majority Leader Eric Cantor got primaried and lost his race. And then Speaker Boehner was out shortly thereafter. Obama, of course, won re-election. So I do think that it's important to think of who gets blamed in these kind of fiscal debacles, whether it's a government shutdown, which historically is where the blame lands with Republicans. And that's why uh, the Senate Republican leadership, including Mitch McConnell, do not encourage uh, the House Republicans to go forward with a shutdown narrative. This is not something that is as cut as dry as who is the president and then who gets blamed. And we saw that the first time around in 2011. But the first reaction I have is a sort of a visceral uh, you got to be kidding me. Well, but Henrietta, there is a question about who uh, in the presidential candidate's race is going to come out and say, we plan to cut the deficit. And oh, yeah, here are the benefits that you're not going to get as a result of it. We're getting some of the Republican candidates' plans, and it looks a lot like the former President Trump's plans, where he talks about not cutting anything, uh, but having fiscal discipline. Where is that fiscal discipline going to come from? Uh, that's a great question. You know, I come through um, Ron DeSantis's economic agenda, and in part of it, it's either it's a little bit unclear, but there's a fourth estate that he plans to abolish, which is either bureaucracy or the press. And I can't fathom for the life of me how either one of those gets three percent GDP growth or reduces the deficit. Um, unsubsidizing electric vehicles. Again, I don't know how that gets there. What we saw in 2011, right before or as this was all coming through, is President Obama and Speaker Boehner had agreed to reforming entitlements on the Medicare and Medicaid side, as well as hiking 800 billion, excuse me, hiking 800 billion dollars worth of taxes. They had fiscal discipline. We had the potential for the super committees, the Simpson Bowles committees. There were ideas thrown out all day long, and the reality was that this Congress could not. Um, find a way to get to yes on anything practical that would actually dent the deficit. And I'm sorry, $100 billion, 
out of fiscal year 2024 is not going to move the needle in a $33 trillion deficit reduction economy. There's a broader question about when political instability in the U.S. will actually start to matter for markets. And we're asking that with respect to the debt ceiling debate. And we're asking that with respect to the presidential race, where there's more and more uncertainty being piled on with each additional legal case that comes out on both sides of the aisles, the latest being the indictment of the former president uh, for, a genu for, for the election and some of his comments around that. Henrietta, when will that start to matter? Um, I, I think what we've seen from the business community is little blips. So, for instance, in the wake of the January 6th insurrection, there was a temporary freeze put on all political fundraising and donations from major corporations, Johnson & Johnson and the like, to, to um, individual members. Um, all of whom were from the Republican conference at the time, but that has obviously already gone away and members are back to pouring in money. Um, groups like the Business Roundtable, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, they're fighting for influence however they can, and that includes spending dollars and giving to campaign donations. So that is a proxy for Wall Street's participation on Capitol Hill, in my opinion, and it has shown no signs of materially changing. Henrietta, wonderful to get your perspective on things. Henrietta Trace there. Aveda Partners down in Washington, D.C. on the latest. This equity market for now is recovering. It was down by something like 1% on the S&P 500. We're negative by 0.44%. Lots of people lining up to say this decision doesn't matter, but also lining up to tell you why they think it doesn't matter. They all want to be heard. So here's Jason Furman. Thank you for this, Jason. At on Twitter. He says this. A year ago, Fitch upgraded the U.S. AAA credit rating outlook from negative to stable, and it set out the criteria for a downgrade. So three points he makes. Three points they made. Significant and sustained rise in the debt to GDP ratio, Jason says, didn't happen. Deterioration in governance quality, hard to see that much has changed. And on the third point, macroeconomic policy performance and prospects, he's making a point, Lisa, much more improved from last year. So based on the criteria they offered for a downgrade last year, what's changed? I would suggest that if you speak to Fitch today, anyone in the media, that's a template to have a conversation with them about what has changed in the last 12 months and what changed for them in the last 24 hours. And I would add that Brad Setzer, formerly of the Treasury Department, put this out on Twitter. Strange timing from Fitch, reiterating that. U.S. debt to GDP is heading down. The term premium is negative, talking exactly about the same point. So to that point, if things have actually improved, what is the threshold? Is it just simply because the debt ceiling, once again, was an issue in Washington, D.C., as it has been every single year for years? I'm not saying their views are painted by their politics, but both of those individuals have worked for both the Biden administration and for the Obama administration. That's uh, Jason Furman and Brad Sester, respectively, correct? Yes. OK, just putting that out there, just so you know where those views come from, because there's going to be a lot of political back and forth down in Washington, D.C., about he says, she says, and the blame game is going to continue. Equities on the S&P 500, if you are just tuning in, welcome to the programme. The S&P negative here by 0.45%. Coming up at the 8 a.m. hour, so in about 45 minutes from now, we'll be catching up with Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Looking forward to that conversation, Lisa, to work out with him what we've been talking about all morning with the likes of Robert Tipp from PGM. OK, we don't care about it. It's justified. It's not justified. Does it matter to markets? Does it actually change anything for the Treasury market this morning that we now have both Fitch and S&P Global Ratings saying you're no longer AAA, you're double A? I also want to hear from him. The, a lot of the pushback to Fitch mattering has come from people who say the U.S. economy is stronger than it has been. It is not headed toward recession anymore. We've heard that from Bank of America and others. And actually, if anything, we have a better profile. Bob Michael thinks that actually we're heading into a period of weakness. So how could that be sort of underpinning uh, some sort of different call from his perspective, given that he does see weakness and he sees Treasury yields still going down materially to about 3 percent? That recession call just kind of get him pushed out a little bit. There's much more going on than just this. Let's be clear about that. The ADP report, as Lisa has pointed out, comes out in about one hour from now. That's the appetizer ahead of the main event, the main course on Friday, the payrolls report. And then in between those two big earnings reports that we'll get from the likes of Apple and Amazon in Thursday's session after the close. So a look ahead to all of that with Amy with Silverman of RBC Capital in about 30 minutes from now. In about five minutes, we head back down to Washington, D.C. Need to touch base with AMH on the legal issues of the former president from New York City this morning with equities recovering just a touch. Good morning. Today, an indictment was unsealed, charging Donald J. Trump with conspiring to defraud the United States, 
conspiring to disenfranchise voters, and conspiring and attempting to obstruct an official proceeding. The attack on our nation's capital on January 6, 2021, was an unprecedented assault on the seat of American democracy. As described in the indictment, it was fueled by lies. In this case, my office will seek a speedy trial so that our evidence can be tested in court and judged by a jury of citizens. That was Jack Smith, the U.S. Department of Justice Special Counsel, the third criminal prosecution of the former president as the former president makes another run for the White House. That indictment coming on the same day that we got this poll from Siena College, New York Times, showing 54 percent of likely GOP voters across demographics supporting the former president compared to just 17 percent for his nearest competitor in this upcoming primary for Republicans. So that support is pretty loud and clear. Just going to want to put this out there. Within minutes after the indictment came out, the Trump campaign sent out a fundraising email. And in it, he said, uh, it's not just my freedom on the line, but yours as well, and I will never let them take it from you. It has been used as a fundraising tool, and it has been effective, even though people know that their money is going to simply fight the legal battle. Still with us this morning, I'm pleased to say, AMA Chamery, our chief Washington correspondent. Amory, I'm losing count. Florida. New York, <laughs> Washington, potentially one more still to come. Yes, this is the third indictment the former president is facing. We got the, these charges yesterday, and then there's one more we're waiting on, and this is the Fulton County one in Georgia. Uh, but Fonnie Willis, the district attorney there, says she's ready to go. They spent two and a half years on this research, so we can expect that likely before September 1st. That is what she has said publicly. So that would be a fourth indictment for a former president, and we just need to really make it very clear this is not just a former president. This is a candidate for the Republican nomination for 2024. Uh, so this is going to be an election like no other if he does end up becoming the nominee for the GOP. Of these four, Anne-Marie, if you were to rank them, are some much more serious than others? Absolutely. And we spoke to Ty Cobb this week, who served in the White House under Trump. He was part of the White House counsel. And he talked about this overwhelming evidence of the document case. And you can see that if you read the charges of the documents case, we also had that superseding indictment last week regarding the documents case in terms of Trump trying to allegedly uh, alter the surveillance video. So there's a lot of hard evidence. This one, as Terry Haynes talked about, is very serious conspiracy to defraud the United States, as well as uh, obstruction of justice and conspiracy against rights. Conspiracy, basically, to say you, your vote does not count. These are incredibly uh, enormous. I can't really uh, uh, express the gravity of these charges, but potentially they are going to be harder to prove, as Terry Haynes said. So I would say these two are the, the top-ranked ones. Georgia follows uh, just below that, because that, as well, would be a charge against trying to defraud voters' rights and the election. And then, of course, there's the hush money case in New York, which many have pretty much shrugged off. And, Marie, going forward, there is a real question of when this starts to matter for uh, the election. If, President Trump, if former President Trump is convicted, does any of this potentially eliminate his chance of being president? In other words, does any of this actually matter legally for his ability to rule the nation? Well, we need to see how this plays out in court, first off. Uh, the issue would become very difficult for the former president is if there is a charge in a specific state where Trump would not be able to say he was, because this could take months or years, say he was to become president, hypothetically. If there is a charge in a state, he cannot pardon himself from that state charge. He would have to get a friendly governor to do so. So say, right now, in, in Georgia, that could be the case. But in New York, definitely not. Meanwhile, on the other side, President Biden also uh, coming under fire for his participation, uh, reportedly, in some calls with his son that had to do with business transactions that he said he wasn't uh, aware of or involved with. How much are people becoming utterly desensitized, or does it matter more on one side than another? Has this just basically become a tribalized election regardless? I think, as John said in the first hour of programming, that there is a little bit of fatigue in the country when it comes to whether it's indictments, whether it's cases against Hunter Biden. Um, sometimes there's so much news coming out of Washington, D.C., it's hard for individuals to really sift through um, all of this. But what you'll see on both sides is they're going to want to talk about the weaponization 
um, from the Republicans, some of which will talk about the weaponization of, Bi they'll call it Biden's Justice Department, given these indictments under Trump are coming under Biden. And then the Republicans will also talk about the fact that as Biden basically, uh, they'll say he lied in terms of his business dealings with Hunter Biden. Although we did have the close associate of Hunter Biden testify behind closed doors at a hearing this week at the Oversight Committee in Congress, and Devin Archer basically said, in, uh, in ter according to lawmakers coming out and speaking to individuals um, off record or on background, saying that the president would call, potentially stop into a dinner, but it was really just to say hi to Hunter. It wasn't involved with the business dealings. But this is something that optically will be a problem for the current president as he looks for re-election in 2024. These legal issues that are coming up, Anne-Marie, remind us of the kind of issues we might witness in emerging markets. When Fitch comes out and cites governance issues, do these issues speak to that? Well... This, I think there's a link between these two top stories today, and I say that because if you look back at the report that Fitch put out in June, they talked about political polarization, and they talked about the fact that that has gotten worse since this debate or the, the Trump campaign trying to um, relitigate the 2020 election and the 2020 election interference that the Trump campaign was trying to want. Increased political polarization and partisanship as witnessed by the contested 2020 election. That's what Fitch cited in their June warning. Then we get a downgrade yesterday, moments ahead of the former president being indicted. That is just going to show how much more politicized Washington is and potentially what that means for the reputation and the fiscal health of the U.S. economy. Three weeks away from the first debate. The first debate, Anne-Marie, and we still don't really know who's going to be on that stage. Is the former president going to show up? Have we heard anything in the last couple of days? To be determined if he shows up, um, I think I'm sure his lawyers potentially want him to sit this one out. But this is obviously going to get a ton of eyeballs. He's going to be attacked, we know, at least by Governor Chris Christie. We also had a statement yesterday from Vice President Mike Pence, one of his harshest yet, saying that no man is above the Constitution. That person should not be president. He knows he's going to be attacked, so potentially he wants to be there to defend himself and make sure he's part of the show. But we do not have a yes or no yet from the Trump camp on whether or not he will attend that debate in Milwaukee. MH. Thank you. Anne-Marie down in Washington, D.C. We'll no doubt catch up with you a little bit later. Three weeks away, that debate, the first GOP debate. And, Lisa, to Anne-Marie's point, we've got a decent idea of how both the former governor of New Jersey, Chris Christie, will deal with these allegations. We've got a decent idea how the former vice president, Mike Pence, is going to deal with this. How's Governor DeSantis going to approach this subject three weeks out? It's been really tough for him because when he has gone against uh, the former president, he's been booed and he's lost support. So how does he go head on while not alienating a lot of the base that does associate themselves with the former president? And this is sort of the push-pull. I personally am more interested to hear about their economic plans. And I feel like this noise is overriding some of the issues that when you actually talk about people's day-to-day -day, matters most to them. Economy, top of the pile which is why some people suggest we had that pivot this week from Governor DeSantis, the declaration of economic independence. What was it? We win, they lose. That's basically They're it. They're still trying to work out who the we are and who the they is. I think it was very clearly, I mean, there are a lot of we's and they's, but it's also we being the United States and they being China. That's a big one that you're going to hear more and China more about. China or the rest of the world? Yeah, well, that's going to be another issue. That's a good or question. Or just China. We'll find out. Yeah. Hopefully we can catch up with the, the governor from Florida ahead of those debates. Equities right now on the S&P, trying to stage a recovery. Negative here by 0.5%. Plenty more coverage on this downgrade from Fitch. We'll catch up with Brian Weiss, the Morgan Stanley Investment Management, up next. Live from New York City, good morning. Let's try and drain the drama out of this situation for you this Wednesday morning. Good morning to you all. Your equity market stays in a bit of a recovery. It's down by 0.4%. Call it down 0.5 on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, we're negative by 0.71%, going into an important day for the Nasdaq 100 tomorrow after the close when we hear from Amazon and Apple. The equity market reaction so far pretty contained to the downgrade from Fitch yesterday stripping the United States with AAA credit rating. In the bond market, not much reaction at all. To look at a two-year 
10 year, 30 year, 10 years doing nothing, basically unchanged to down and maybe a basis point to 4.0131%. The two year yield down by four basis points. So a little bit of a rally there at 486 on a two year. The move really was yesterday at the longer end of the curve on the 30 year yield higher by I think something like eight basis points on a session. 4.0948% is where we are at the moment. Before that downgrade, and I think this is probably the more important piece of information we've had for the bond market in the last 24 hours, came from the Treasury Department and they've increased their net borrowing estimate for this quarter, July through September, to $1 trillion. That's up from the previous estimate of $733 billion. And those billions matter to this bond market, and they mattered yesterday. In the FX market, I want to finish on the euro, just showing a bit of weakness against the dollar. The dollar a bit stronger to 109.77 on euro dollar, negative a tenth of 1%. The Japanese yen a bit stronger, perhaps speaking to a little bit of risk aversion out there, but really the emphasis here is on a little bit of risk aversion out there at the moment. Under surveillance this morning, Fitch rating, stripping the US of its top tier sovereign credit rating, cutting it from AAA to AA plus in a statement writing this, the rating downgrade of the United States reflects the expected fiscal deterioration over the next three years, a high and growing general government debt burden, and leads to this final point, the erosion of governance relative to AA and AAA rated peers. Which, as you've mentioned, is indisputable given all of the discussions around the debt ceiling debate and whether or not we could default. That said, the idea that you're talking about that 30-year Treasury and the, the borrowing that we're going to see in about an hour time in terms of how much the U.S. needs to keep borrowing, these stories are interlinked. And it raises a question, even if you could shrug off Fitch, can you shrug off a financial profile that isn't as good when it just comes to the interest expenses and the outright borrowing at a time when who's buying? We know the United States has a special place in our market universe, an exceptional place and arguably by many people and they'll make this argument irreplaceable. But the governance issues are inconsistent with other peers in the AAA rated bucket. We've talked about Germany. The debt pile is inconsistent with other members of the AAA rated bucket and we can do a basic assessment of that. The debt to GDP ratio of the United States is north of 100 percent and the median of a AAA rated company or rather AAA rated country, we could talk about companies later, is close to 40 percent. It's kind of night and day. The argument, though, that a lot of people would say is this has been the case for more than a year. It's not like something has changed. If anything has changed, the debt to GDP has actually come in slightly. You could see that the U.S. economy is on a better trajectory. People are talking about soft landing. So if they were going to do this, why now? And I think that increasingly has been the question. The decision to publish that decision came literally moments before this. The former president indicted in Washington on federal charges over his efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election. Special counsel Jack Smith telling reporters the attack on our nation's capital on January 6th, 2021, was an unprecedented assault on the seat of American democracy. It was fueled by lies, lies by the defendant. The charges can carry penalties, of course, of as much as 20 years in prison. The president expected in court Lisa, on August 3rd. And he is expected uh, to come with a host of lawyers. I still can't get over the fact that within minutes of the indictment, he sent out a fundraising email and that people are viewing this as a rallying call in terms of his supporter base. So it raises a question, what are the legal consequences and what are the political consequences at a time when a lot of people view the state as being politicized and other people are saying, well, if you just look at the nuts and bolts, it looks like this is highly problematic and some serious charges. It's the desensitization that creates some real question marks around what's going to stick. If you want to drown in negativity this morning, it's easy to. Around the US government, super easy. Around the former president, super, super easy. Around the debt profile of America, even easier. Well done, Fitch. <laughs> but I think bottom line is this economy right now, compared to what's happening elsewhere, Germany's just about coming out of recession. Europe's struggling to growth. China's talking about stimulus. And we've got guest after guest dropping their recession call. Mike Gaper of Bank of America with this to say that recent incoming data has made us reassess our prior view that a mild recession in 2024 is the most likely outcome for the U.S. economy. Growth and economic activity over the past three quarters has averaged 2.3 percent. The unemployment rate has remained near all time lows and wage and price pressures are moving in the right direction, albeit gradually. Now, forgive me if I get too personal and emotional about this. It's easy to trash the politics in America. It's easy to trash the debt in America. Every time I had to go and get a visa before I went and got a green card, there was a line around the building, literally around the building, before the sun even came up. The amount of people lining up still to come into this country, despite its political problems, despite the problem with the debt, 
this economy right now, just on where we are currently, better than most of the developed world at the moment. And the political situation, I get it. It's incredibly divisive, but people quite literally are lining up to leave their country to move here. And the reason why is because of the economy and the fact that you can make money and the fact that consumers are spending and they're willing to spend on a lot of things and businesses profit from this. I was looking at this yesterday. We talk a lot about consumer spending and how long it can continue. Well, after about a third of U.S. results of U.S. consumer companies, consumer facing companies, consumer discretionary companies, they have beaten earnings projections by 13 percent versus an average 7 percent across 11 sectors. They are doing better than the others, even though you do have some outliers. So people still spending and that is leading to profits at a lot of the companies that service them. Now, let's get back to trash in the market. We can do that with <laughs> Brian Weinstein, head of fixed income at Morgan Stanley Investment Management. Brian, good morning to you. Welcome to the program. It's good to catch up again. I just wonder, we've asked this question of many people this morning. I wanted to give you the opportunity to respond to it as well. How did you respond initially when that headline dropped? I mean, I was minding my own business on a quiet summer Friday at my desk, um, and uh, I was surprised. I mean, not surprised. I mean, all the things you guys highlight, we, we've known, right? The discourse is ugly. The amount of spending is is tremendous. It's amazing. It's, it's mind-boggling. Um, and then there's the simple fact, John, as you said, that the U.S. Treasury market is kind of the key to all the markets, so it's not going to be treated differently today than it was yesterday. But I look at the market and go, wait a second, listen to all the, all the good stuff you guys said, too. So you have all the good things happening, plus you have the fact that we have some fiscal and, and maybe political issues. Why are, are people really going to be willing to accept a 4% tenure note? It seems so high to us because it's been so low, but do a long-term chart, right? I mean, it seems to me the warning sign here is there's a lot of public debt coming, and you don't really need to chase it. I don't think you're going to miss it. So I was surprised that we didn't sell off more this morning at the end of the day. Brian, what you just said I think is so important. The 10-year yield feels so high because over the last 10 years it's been so low. If you could just erase the history of the last decade or so, Brian, if you could just reset and go through the fundamentals of America and acknowledge that it has this privileged position in our market universe at the very epicenter of it, what do you think the yield should be on a 10-year? Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I think about this all the time. So if we think that inflation is now going to average higher than 2%, which I think, yeah, go ahead, do a long-term chart of inflation, 2% target seems low. Um, so I think what you really want is you want to think about inflation being, say, 2 to 3. And if growth averages 2 to 3, then 4% is the bottom of your 10-year range, right? Could you have a 10-year range in a 4 to 6, right? Maybe it's a little too tight. Maybe it should be 3 it's three to 7 or 3.5 to to, to 7.5. Like, so maybe this is the bottom of a range if you have normal-ish uh, growth and inflation averaging more than 2. And by the way, a central bank that doesn't buy all the supply. So I don't think it's crazy to see a 10-year note go another 100 basis points higher from here. Not immediately, but, but over over time. How much conviction do you have in that, Brian? Are you actually allocating differently and shifting away from duration in response, yeah. not necessarily to Fitch, but the borrowing announcement that we're probably going to get in less than an hour time? There's a lot of borrowing that's going to happen. And so I think the combination of the surprising resilience in the economy, which is important to note, um, and the fact that you are getting good yields in credit, right? If you look at bank loans, if you look at high yield, you can get 8 to 10%. Now, you'll get some defaults in there, so you won't get your full 8 to 10%. But you don't need to take duration risk. So this was the year of the bond, right? And I think the year of the bond was supposed to be not the year of the equity. So it hasn't played out that way. Um, bonds have done fine, right? Bonds have given you the coupon that they promised. I think that's what you should expect from bonds, right? So if we have a short, sell a, a long-term sell-off, tenure notes move higher over time, you're much better off in non-duration sectors with yields i.e. credit, then I think you are just trying to buy duration and hope for you, hoping that yields go back low. So, yes, we're, we are investing more and more in that direction. How much has that evolution in terms of an investment thesis happened over the past couple of weeks? I would say, I think I was on with you guys like, um, like six weeks ago, and, and I had believed that we could take a run back towards you know, 3% in 10-year notes, that you could play that recession story. The Fed was, was obviously wanting to pause, and here we are. But again, yeah, I think the Fitch thing might be the, the, the final nail in that in that coffin. But the idea is with stronger growth, with inflation, I think, looking stickier, the next two or three months, it won't look that way. But I think when you go towards the end of the year, you'll see inflation not falling so much on a year-over-year -year basis. It's just the math, right? Um, so it's evolved, right? At the beginning of the year, I was not in a camp that you could see four and a quarter, four and a half um, tenure notes. But but uh, but the last couple of weeks has made me feel like investors should be demanding more premium uh, in a world where inflation is sticky. Uh, growth is uh, it seems sticky to um, in a good way, and then you throw in um, some of the uh, fiscal irresponsibility uh, on top of it. Um, I, I think it's going to happen. I just think it's a matter of time. Brian, here's a nice exercise for you. Someone somewhere 
has started to write a speech for Chairman Powell, potentially to deliver at Jackson Hole at the end of August. Brian, if you had to write that speech at the moment and it was going to have some shelf life to deliver at the end of August, what do you think that speech is going to sound like? You know, I, I think he might take a different approach. I think he might not want this one to have shelf life, right? I think this is a, a point in time where the Fed has raised rates a lot. Listen, let's not forget on the other side of raising rates a lot, um, over the next 12 months, there will be impacts, there will be slowdowns. as you're seeing it in some of the subprime sectors. Um, you know, you're not seeing it in the broad, broad economy, but it matters. So I, I think the Fed is taking a pause here because they just don't know. And so I, I hate to answer your question, it sounds like a cop out. I think this speech could be boring because the Fed wants to be boring. They want to let the markets go in some ways. If they could engineer a soft landing, it's so rare. It would be an amazing outcome. And so to to, to really, re he might talk about fiscal responsibility, and we've seen we've seen Fed, Fed chairman, you know, take take some stabs at that. He hasn't really yet. But I think this speech could be one where we forget about it. Just to put it on the record, I still don't know if he's going to speak in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I don't think any of us do yet. Brian, thank you, sir, for weighing in. Brian Weiss in there, Morgan Stanley I'm Investment Management, with a, an honest assessment of where he thinks this bond market's going to be. I think it's a difficult one for Chairman Powell. Certainly the speech that he's going to deliver, if he does deliver, one in late August is going to be very different to the one he delivered 12 months ago. Are you trying to get him to take August off so that he can set the tone for the rest of Wall Street? Is that what's going on? Because pretty steadily you've raised this sort of suspicion. Maybe he's not going to show up. He's just going to stay on vacation, which nobody has said. I'm suggesting there's not much to say right now. I would agree Between with that. the last meeting and the next one, there's two CPI prints, two payrolls reports, one of which we get on Friday. Why say anything at all? Just wait for those two to come in, let the market move based on what the incoming information is and make a move in September if you need to. The one thing he could say is the importance in getting back to 2% with speed, right? Does it matter that it's going to take until 2025 to get inflation back to the level that they're looking for? If you are just joining the program, welcome to the program on the S&P 500. We're negative here by 0.5%. Coming up shortly, 8.30 Eastern time, we'll catch up with Ron Arnott of Research Affiliates. Before we get to Rob, I've got a great lineup for you. So Amy Wu Silverman of RBC Capital Markets on the way this equity market is set up, going into some big earnings reports starting tomorrow from Apple and Amazon. And then in the 8 o'clock hour, so starting at about 18 minutes from now, on the bond market, Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management, Nathan Sheets of Citigroup, formerly, of course, of PGM as well. And somewhere in between, you get an ADP report. So we'll catch up with Mike McKee. And for those of you with a decent memory, don't think you need that good a memory. About a month ago, we had an ADP report which had a blowout number and completely changed the conversation going into payrolls Friday. So we'll see what we get in about 30 minutes from now. That's why I say it always matters until it doesn't it's matter. It's always the way. No one cares and, about ADP yeah. until the second after it drops and it's a surprise. But if we're data dependent, when does the data matter? Do we take some sort of signal from the jolts data that we got yesterday, or do people just shrug it off and say this is noisy uh, and it really is backward looking? I mean, it seems like choose your own narrative, but people are in a narrative shift moment. It feels like there is something and a reassessment happening in the past couple of days. People want new narratives to come to life all at once. The fact of the matter is we're in this process where job openings are coming down. Lending standards have tightened in response to the increases we've had from the Federal Reserve over the past year, and you've seen that pretty continuously now over the last couple of months, the last few quarters. But nobody's collapsing, so nobody cares until Precisely. they do. And that's sort of the issue. We're seeing that shift slowly grind its way into certain parts of the market. It hasn't made a dent in employment. Let's put it that way. Unemployment still expected to come in on Friday in at around 3.5% or so, 3.6% to be precise, I think. Your equity market recovering, well off session lows on the S&P 500, negative by 0.47%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. I was thinking about this last night, the differences between this downgrade yesterday and it was actually I think August 5th of 2011 was the downgrade. The yield setup was actually very different. Yields were falling into the 2011 downgrade. Yields were in a downtrend. We kind of have a saying, surprises always break in the direction of the trend. And the trend in yield is up right now. That was Chris Verone a little bit earlier on this morning, the partner and head of technical macro strategy at Strategus. Special thanks to Robert Burgess of Bloomberg for, I would say, inspiring this exercise to look back on August 5th, 2011 and take a look at what's happened with markets cross asset ever since then. All the doom and gloom you heard back then about America's position in financial markets, about what would happen to the US dollar. The dollar index since then, DXY, has advanced about 40 percent. And US capital markets, US dollar denominated financial markets have outperformed the rest of the world in a big way, particularly against places like 
Europe. Of course, the compare and contrast back in 2011 was Europe was drowning in a Eurozone debt crisis. The growth backdrop, we were talking about double dips here, there and all over the place. And now we're talking about pretty robust growth in America this morning. Which raises the question, what's the alternative and what is the haven that could replace the U.S.? And you brought this up earlier. I think it's increasingly important to really think about if people are saying this is a concern with the U.S. debt increasing and the borrowing increasing so significantly. I mentioned that one guest that we caught up with, that one source, I think, down in Australia. What does replace it? Japanese government bonds when Bitcoin. the BOJ owns half the market, the European debt market. We know that mess over the last 10 years or so. What replaces it? Bitcoin, evidently, and Apple and Amazon. Is that sort of what people have done is basically say, look. It doesn't have the depth. Yeah, it doesn't have the depth. No, nothing can replace it. And that's what everybody is saying. Joining us now, I'm pleased to say on the equity market, away from bonds for a moment, A.B. Wolf Silverman, the head of derivative strategy at RBC Capital Markets. There's this great line in your note, Amy. Just allow me to share that with our audience. There is a reluctance to be the strategist who cried low vol. Amy, just explain what you mean by that. Yeah, you know, look, we have been telling folks for a while now that when you look at the cost of hedging, over a decade, we're really at historical lows. So, you know, an S&P or Q put that struck 5% out of the money, John, these are trading at historical lows now. But the problem is, you know, low vol often begets low vol the same way positive momentum begets momentum. So you don't want to be the strategist who cried low vol, but still, you know, it's just really important to highlight how inexpensive these hedging costs have gotten in the face of kind of this huge sentiment shift into something more positive. I mean, when you say that low vol can beget low vol, are we seeing that develop currently? Is that what you're seeing? We are. And, you know, to some degree, it's a little concerning because there are these time frames where low vol begets low vol, which begets low vol until it doesn't. So 2011, which I know you guys have been talking about in the context of the last debt ceiling, uh, or 2018 for us in the derivatives world, which which led to Volmageddon, you know, it doesn't mean it necessarily hearkens these events, but oftentimes these low volatility cycles does beget uh, kind of a gap down at some point to higher volatility regimes. Does it feel, based on the metrics that you look at, that we're at a tipping point, a narrative shift, a point at which the higher Treasury yields and some of the jitters that we're seeing in certain corners are starting to percolate out into uh, the way people are shifting? You know, not yet, Lisa. Maybe that changes a little because the downgrade news for the U.S. is relatively fresh. But I will tell you, when you look to earnings, when you look to single stock volatility, it's sort of exuberance all around. And that has really been true where, you know, to Tom's favorite word, the skew of the market has leaned much more to the call side. And that's part of this low volatility situation you're seeing, which is there's just been much more demand for upside. And a lot of that has to do with the relative lack of positioning we saw that caught people off sides, that created FOMO. And there are still folks who need to dive in the pool. You know, that's how I would characterize the options market right now. How important will the earnings that we get tomorrow of Amazon and Apple be in shaping some of that optimism? Have earnings confirmed the optimism and this feeling of FOMO that everyone seems to be expressing? Yes, I think it has. And, and I think the two earnings we'll get tomorrow, which is, you know, kind of 20 percent of waiting will be very important. What's interesting for Amazon and Apple is you're actually seeing a divergence here. So Amazon's call skew is actually very high, meaning, you know, there's a good deal of bullish sentiment. That's actually not true in Apple, which is also very different than the other mega cap techs we saw. So I'll be interested to see how that plays out because you're actually seeing on those two stocks a divergence in that option sentiment positioning going into earnings. Amy, can we just finish up by maybe thinking about what's developed in the last 12 hours from Fitch and the downgrade of the US government credit rating from AAA to AA plus? From someone in your seat, do you consider governance issues, political dislocations, the disputes, the division down in DC as a source for volatility or something to ignore? I think it absolutely is. And one thing I'll say, John, is the options market in general is absolutely terrible at pricing political and geopolitical events. It just it just really is bad at handicapping it. And you saw that in 2011. So if we go back to that debt ceiling, we had a VIX spike at 40. And part of it was just this inability to handicap how situations like these play out. So right now, I would say the market is sort of nodding this off. 
I don't know if that changes down the line, but historically, you know, the options market tends to be the worst at pricing events that are not catalyst driven, but much more of these political overhangs. People are talking about the election next year and how much of an overhang that could be introducing potential volatility. Is that something that you're expecting or seeing anything related to? Or for now, is it basically all about the earnings, all about the economy and not at all about drama that people have gotten desensitized to? Yeah, you know, look, I actually think investors really should be focusing on that because it's sort of this tie into what needs to happen this year because it likely wouldn't happen next year. But, you know, one thing that's structurally happened in the options market is we've gotten much more short term. That's partly related to the rise of zero DTE trading, just the tenor reduction overall to manage these data events. But the options market, which was short term to begin with, has gotten even more short term, while I would say the long term risks have risen when you look out to 2024. Amy, great to get your input and some insight from you. On the latest in DC and beyond, Amy with Silverman there of RBC Capital Markets responded to that downgrade from Fitch yesterday afternoon, looking ahead to those earnings from Apple and Amazon after the close on Thursday. Looking ahead to this programme, getting the likes of Bob Michael at JP Morgan Asset Management to respond to the latest developments in this bond market, the Treasury issuance we can expect through this quarter and beyond, and where he thinks this Treasury market should be. Not so long ago, he was looking for a real slowdown in this economy, imminent rate cuts and yields dropping to 3% right across the curve. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year, twos out to 30s, 3.00%. So we'll get the latest from Bob. The compare and contrast from City this morning, pretty clear. On the downgrade, just one line from Andrew Hoddenhorst, we expect no market reaction. Here's the bulk of the piece. 10-year Treasury yields are back above 4%. 30-year yields are at the highs of the year for 2023. The move higher in long-term yields anticipates a solid jobs number on Friday which would highlight the resilience of the U.S. economy. Wait for this. Their estimates for Friday payrolls, 290,000. Consensus right now, 200K. Lisa, Andrew and the team looking for 290. And as we heard from Amy Wu Silverman and many other people, if you look at the earnings, they confirm the strength. You hear about hiring on the margins, even as a number of companies still prune. But they've been paring back. The layoffs already happened, and a lot of companies have shown a reluctance to cut further because of their experience during the pandemic. So if we get that kind of number, is that a catalytic event? Or are people just so basically drilled into this feeling that you get a soft landing, you get yields coming in, you get inflation coming in, and you can keep chugging along without the pain that we heard about a year ago? We hope we can do that. Look, when inflation's threatening to go through double digits... You can make the argument maybe that higher unemployment is a, a price worth paying to get inflation down. And of course, I've always said this, it's easy to say when it's not your job on the line and you're the chairman of the Federal Reserve and you've got a guaranteed term. When inflation's down to, say, three and unemployment's still three and a half percent, can you make the argument that juice is worth the squeeze, that higher unemployment is worth that 100 basis points lower in CPI? Is that something you're fully committed to? That's exactly why what Brian Weinstein over at Morgan Stanley, what he said was fascinating to me, saying that in the past couple of weeks, he's thinking more about that reality, not getting back down to 2 percent, could it going more to 3 percent. And that means that 4 percent is the bottom of the range for yields for 10 year treasuries. That is a game changer for the entire risk reward spectrum. And so have people game that out. I'm very curious to hear what Bob Michael has to say about that. Actually. Alarian's been great on that, yeah. about maybe tolerating a higher inflation a higher inflation rate, and many people have pushed back against it. I would also say that PIMCO's Rich Clarida are talking about tolerating two-point-something in a secular outlook, a key feature of their work over the last few months as well. So if you're just tuning in, this is how the stage is set through the rest of this morning. In about 20 minutes, we'll get the ADP report, so a jobs report from ADP ahead of the real one, the headline one, on Friday, the official payrolls report. We're looking for a decent number on Friday, 200K. Mike McKee's going to break down that ADP report. Bob Michael's going to be sat in that seat just there from JP Morgan breaking down this bond market. Your equity market's doing OK. It was much lower than this a little bit earlier. The S&P 500 is negative by 0.5%. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. It's never good when a rating agency says, OK, we don't like your debt as much as we used to. Clearly, it's not good news. But if we look at the initial market reaction, pretty moderate reaction in the bond market. No country that has the strength of the U.S. is going to be affected. The main question is, does this compromise the reserve currency status yes. of the U.S. dollar? I've learned very painfully that one never wants to 
forecast the demise of the dollar. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. A collective shrug of the shoulders on Wall Street this morning. Secretary Yellen calling the move arbitrary, outdated. Mohamed Alarian labelled the downgrade a strange move. Larry Summers said he can't imagine any serious analyst giving the decision weight. That decision to strip America of its AAA credit rating. Fitch, the latest, more than 10 years, more than a decade after we saw the same thing from S&P Global Ratings. Lisa, they gave three reasons. We've gone through those reasons all morning. If you are just tuning in, welcome. We can do it again if you wish. It reflects the expected fiscal deterioration, a high and growing general government debt burden, the erosion of, of governance, those three issues, topics we've been talking about for more than a decade now. And this from Peter Scheer of Academy Securities just moments ago. No one buys treasuries because of the rating. And what he talked about were all the same issues, including some of the debt ceiling debates and the lack of agreement in Washington. But he said, why do people buy the assets of the U.S.? Not the ability to tax, but the value of the land and things like drilling rights. And that, I think, is what people are really demonstrating this morning. Well said, Peter Chair. We can talk lots about the political fallout. Let's talk about the market fallout and how limited it is. Check out the markets right now. Equity futures are down by something like 0.5%. For now, let's see if that changes. In the bond market, no movement at all. You'd have no idea anything happened. Your 10-year yield, 4.02% on a 10-year at the moment, totally unchanged. The euro against the dollar, totally unchanged. The data... Arguably, potentially more important for now, not over the next 5, 10, 20 years, but for now, the data more important for many. And that data, Lisa, comes in about 13 minutes. Which data? And this, I think, will be the key question going forward in a couple of in the next couple of months. You're talking about ADP and the employment report from them. The latest read on whether there is pain or whether there still is strength. At 8.30, there is another bit of data from the Treasury Department talking about how much money they're going to have to borrow in this quarter, and it's expected to be almost $275 billion more than previously expected. This plays into the Fitch point, but it's having a more direct impact, potentially, on markets, and that, I think, is worth paying attention the to. The estimate for borrowing this quarter, July out to September, has gone from 7.33 to $1 trillion. So when Secretary Yellen calls the decision to downgrade the debt both arbitrary and outdated, that's probably a conversation we need to have right now. AMH joins us from Washington, our chief Washington correspondent. Amory, wonderful to have you back with us in the programme. We know the political back and forth, the fallout, the blame game. Can you pick up on what Secretary Yellen's got to say about this decision? Well, as you said, Jonathan, she's calling it outdated, arbitrary. When she spoke to me recently, she was even talking about how optimistic she is regarding the U.S. economy as it is coming out of the pandemic. She pointed to a very strong labor market and the fact that she does not see a recession on the horizon, something that Fitch potentially, though, d uh, disagrees with her. They still have that potential in there. Um, I think it was interesting talking to Libby Cantrell yesterday of PIMCO. What she says that she has heard from clients um, around the world when they look at the U.S. economy and where to invest and how they are viewing um, the economic um, resurgence following the pandemic, what she said is that that the U.S. is the cleanest of the dirtiest shirts, meaning everyone is dealing with economic problems, but still, individuals, global investors, still want to put their money in America. And Marie, yesterday we got the one-two punch of both the Fitch downgrade of the U.S. rating, and then we got the announcement of the indictment of the former President Trump. Are these two stories linked in any way? I do think they're linked if you look back at why Fitch, the crux of why Fitch is really coming out with this downgrade now, it comes at a time when they put Washington on watch. And in June, in a report, they talked about the political polarization that is happening in Washington, D.C. And they specifically, I'm looking at the report now, point to this um, 2020 election in terms of the Trump administration trying to overturn the 2020 election results, something that Trump was indicted for just yesterday. And within moments of Fitch coming out with that result, to be honest, we were all uh, on the edge of our seats waiting to see what the charges would be. We knew that special counsel Jack Smith was going to announce something. Trump himself came out and said it would be at 5 p.m. It was a bit after that. We got the Trump Truth Social saying he's about to be indicted. And then Fitch downgraded the U.S. credit rating. And then we got the charges against the former president, which go to the crux of the matter of the 2020 election uh, conspiracy, as well as why you are seeing this political polarization, because this indictment against Trump is obviously going to be very political, because this is not just a former president. 
this is a candidate to be the nominee for the presidential election of November of 2024 for the Republican Party. Can we just go through the timeline, Anne-Marie, just briefly? What are you expecting to hear from the former president? Well, he can truth social at any moment. His lawyer um, has been out and about on all the major networks this morning. We heard him on the Today Show speaking with Savannah Guthrie, talking about the fact that it's the defendant that has a right to a speedy trial because Jack Smith said yesterday he wants a speedy trial, but that they want to take their time. He said the Department of Justice, he actually called it Biden's Department of Justice, they are really trying to say that this is political, um, had three years to investigate this, and they want to take their time. So this is going to take months and years. The most imminent date to watch is going to be tomorrow, and that's when Trump will be arraigned. And we just don't know yet whether or not he is going to come in person to Washington, D.C., or if he'll be arraigned over Zoom, because that is a possibility. Anne-Marie, thank you. MH down in Washington, D.C., with the timeline for Washington and the events in the nation's capital. Here's the timeline for Wall Street this morning. In about nine minutes, we'll get the ADP report. The estimate is 190,000. The previous number, I'm sure some of you remember this number, 497,000, close to 500K. Of course, payrolls came in at 209,000 the following Friday after that report. The estimate for Friday in the payrolls report is 200K. Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan Asset Management joins us around the table here in New York to go through some of this. Bob, good morning. Good morning. What a morning already, <laughs> going yeah, to the ADP report. Let's start with that downgrade. I just wonder from your perspective, and we've asked so many people this question, does it matter to you personally? You hold a lot of this stuff. Does it change anything? Well, that's the question we asked ourselves last night, and we wanted to confirm a number of things. The first thing we did is go through all our client portfolios and made sure that the guidelines exempted treasuries from any kind of ratings. Um, they all do. We went through that exercise in 2011. Then we looked at treasuries in the market. We confirmed that they're still exempt from SEC registration and they still maintain a zero risk weighting in terms of bank capital and liquidity considerations. Then they're also very important in the collateral management market. <clears throat> and we just confirmed that the CFTC and the CME do not reference rating agencies. They only reference U.S. Treasuries. So we wanted to make sure the markets would remain stable. We're confident they would. I think the next thing we're looking for is what does Fitch do with the GSEs? What do they do with the mortgage market? Do they say because it's securitized, it has a higher rating than the sovereign? I don't know. I'm anxious to see what they do there. OK, so for the same things, the same reasons you went through point by point and said that ultimately this downgrade doesn't matter, would the downgrades off the back of it matter? would they have consequences? Elsewhere, have we got downgrades because of those reasons elsewhere? I, I don't think so. And, and we go back to what did Fitch do? And you have to go back to May when they put it on watch. That was a pretty clear signal that in no reasonable period of time would the U.S. be able to get its fiscal deficits, debt to GDP, or how the governance process works into line with what are the nine other remaining AAA-rated sovereigns. And if you go through them one by one and look at debt to GDP, the U.S. is headed to 120 percent. The median of the other nine AAA-rated Fitch sovereigns is 39 percent. You look at fiscal deficits, the U.S. is going to run minus 6 to minus 7 percent. Zero is the median of the other nine AAA sovereigns. So you're miles away. I won't touch governance. I think I heard uh, what Anne Marie said. I think that's down, been dealt with already this morning, Bob. Yeah. Do you know what? We have a lot of clients who love the U.S. markets, love U.S. assets because of the rule of law and the governance. They like the transparency. They like to see the battles on the floor. So then there's a question of just how strong the U.S. economy is, because what a lot of people have pushed back against the Fitch downgrade as saying the U.S. economy is actually increasing and the momentum is just developing. You haven't been saying that. You've been seeing a recession. So do you take that argument that the U.S. is arguably in a stronger position or do you kind of push back on that? Well, the, the one that stands out is modeling the fiscal deficit to unemployment. And with unemployment at 3.4 percent, you wouldn't expect the U.S. to need to run a fiscal deficit of 6 to 7 percent. But for us, unemployment is a lagging indicator. Unemployment is confirmation that we're not in recession 
or confirmation that we are in recession. The high in unemployment is generally a couple quarters after the recession, and the low is generally a couple quarters before recession. We th still think we're headed for recession sometime around year end, and until we're in a recession, unemployment will, yes, remain low. Something we were talking about with Brian Weinstein, and I know that uh, John's been talking about with a number of guests, including Mohammed El Arian, has been that the Fed may allow inflation to go down to just 3 percent or 2.5 percent or something like that, and then stop there with respect to how high they're willing to hold rates. And Brian Weinstein was saying that in that case, you look at 4 percent as a floor for 10-year Treasuries. Why do you not see that as a likelihood? So uh, this brings back flexible av average inflation targeting, go back to 2019, makes sense for me because I wondered if targeting 2% inflation exposes you too much to the 1.6, 1.7, 1.8s, which we've learned is too low for an economy, the complexity and size of the U.S. economy. So I'm all for this sort of two and a quarter, maybe up to 2.4%. That said, what people are now saying is we hit CPI, 9 percent, other measures, you know, high single digits. The, the Fed has thrown an array of policies at it. And you're now in a disinflationary trend, but disinflation will be transitory, that it's coming down like a ski slope and it will stop at two and a half percent. I don't believe that. I think the policies are in place. The long and variable lags are biting. They will hit. People talk about employment. No one's really talked about the ISM employment component. It was 44.4. It's never been at that level without the Fed cutting rates. So throw that in the basket of things that has a perfect track record of the U.S. economy is either in recession, headed to recession, or the Fed should be cutting rates. I don't think you can dismiss all of those things. You talked about the lags. Did you read the Bill Dudley piece on the Bloomberg Terminal yesterday? I'll share the quote with you at home. Bill Dudley said this, the former New York Fed president, there's considerable evidence that the lags have shortened, meaning that the economy has already felt nearly all of the impact of the Fed's actions. What's the argument against that? Businesses and households have locked in a lot of low-cost funding over the last couple of years. That's why the supply of housing on the market isn't there. That's why when you look at corporate fundamentals, Businesses have locked in very low cost of funding. Those things will change as the quarters roll by. Things will need to be refinanced. There will be more borrowing that's put in place. Yes, consumers may have locked in 25 to 3% mortgages, but what's alarming to us is the amount of revolving credit that's been put in place. You look at credit card usage, it's up like that. And that's in the 20% sphere. So consumers are struggling to pay higher prices now. They've tapped out their excess savings. They're on their credit card. We'll see where it all ends up. You're going to stick with us, I hope, after we break this number. The ADP report out in about 60 seconds' time. The estimate is 190,000. The previous number is 500K. Before that number breaks and I cross over to Mike McKee, when do you expect the weakness to turn up in the labour market if we still believe in these long and variable lags? Is that a story for later this summer, later this year, or early 2024? No, I, I think we'll see it before the end of the year. I think we'll see it over the next several months. That jobs report on Friday, the estimate for Friday is that we won't see it on Friday. That's the estimate in our survey. Moving target, of course, I always say that. We get new estimates. Up, estimates get upgraded, updated, downgraded. At the moment, the median estimate is 200,000. The previous read there was 209. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the programme. Just extending this segment to catch up with Bob and break down these job numbers. Going into the job numbers, the equity market looks like this on the S&P 500, down by about 0.5% on the S&P. Yields aren't doing much at all. The 10-year at 4.0171%, down grade what downgrade with the economic data is mike mckee
<laughs> Good morning, John. Well, this is the uh, most important, least important data of the month, and it comes in 324,000, which is a lot bigger than the 190,000 that had been anticipated. However, uh, the previous month, 497, uh, we'll have to see if that's revised, was uh, much higher than the uh, government reported on Friday. Right now, it looks like uh, the big change in goods producing comes in natural resources resources and mining as manufacturing lost 36,000 jobs, ADP says. The, they said they had lost a lot of jobs last month and that hadn't happened. Service providers add 303,000 and of those 201,000 are in that leisure and hospitality uh, group that we like so much. Uh, 237,000 jobs in small establishments, 138,000 medium and large establishments, large businesses lost 67,000 jobs, they say. And finally, we get the uh, pay change numbers from ADP. Job stayers saw their uh, pay increase by 6.2%. Job changers saw theirs increase by 10.2%. And those are numbers. Those numbers are down from previous months. So that does look like uh, perhaps some good news for the Fed. Uh, they do pay attention to some of that. And you know what's really interesting is the Fed gets these ADP raw data, and they have their own model that they make out of it. Uh, and it doesn't seem to match up with what we get. But uh, at this point, uh, ADP suggesting a stronger than expected July payrolls number coming Friday. Mike McKee, stay close, buddy. As always, upside surprise on ADP. It doesn't matter. And then uh, it does. 324 is the number. The estimate was 190. The previous was that blowout, 497. In response to that, there was a rally at the front end of the curve. We've given that up. Yields are now unchanged on a two-year at about 489. Unchanged on a session, yields were lower by something like three or four basis points. We're down now by only one. The 10-year not doing much. In the FX market, the dollar showing just a touch more strength, not a major move. 109.75 on the euro against the dollar. And equities haven't really moved at all in response to this. We're still negative by 0.5%. Alongside Lisa, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Joining us is Bob Michael and Nathan Sheets. Nathan Sheets of City, Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management. Bob, you've had a chance to go through that number. 324, ADP, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Then you get a number like that. Does it matter? It, it fell within my range of expectation for ADP of minus 500,000 to <laughs> plus 500,000. No, it's proven it doesn't matter. I'm looking for the employment report on Friday, and I'm specifically looking for hours worked. That's super helpful. Do you want to stick around? <laughs> sure. Great. Nathan Sheets, great to have you with us on the program, Peter. Nathan. Your thoughts on that jobs number going into Friday. You guys are looking for a big one Friday, right? 290? Yeah, we're at, we're at 290. I think uh, part of the, part of the uh, uh, upside on it is a seasonal adjustment issue. But I think that underneath that, the real narrative is we continue to see the U.S. labor market as being very strong and buoyant. And I think the underlying driver of that is the U.S. consumer spending on services remains very strong. And services are labor intensive, and that has uh, supported employment for the last uh, 18 months or so. And we think that story continues. So what do you make of what Bob Michael was just talking about, the ISM component of the manufacturing survey showing a real deterioration in the employment? There does seem to be on the margin signs that not all is right. Yeah. See, the flip side of the strength in services has been weakness in the manufacturing and the goods sectors. We're uh, in the midst of a rebalance and rotation in, uh, in spending uh, towards services. That's been ongoing now for a while, but it seems like it continues. So uh, for me, one of the puzzles has been, as the goods sectors have softened to the extent that they have, that we haven't seen a little bit more kind of shedding of labor in the manufacturing sector. Uh, and I pointed to that as an example of labor hoarding. Well, maybe we're now getting to a point where some of those firms are saying, well, given where we are and the pressures that we're facing, we're going to have to let some workers go. Or the minimum, we're not going to be able to hire quite as much as we have in the past. Well, and how quickly could this turn? I mean, that's one of the big debates. Could this just fall off a cliff? This is, this is a very important question. And I think when you look at labor market dynamics and you look at the unemployment rate, going into recessions, the unemployment rate is usually pretty flat. And then it moves in a sharp kind of V-shape. And it doesn't send invitations beforehand, say, I'm getting ready to go. It just goes. 
So I think these dynamics could be uh, quite abrupt. Bob Michael's just like me. He can't hide it. He wants to jump in. I can feel it. Bob, what have you got to say? <laughs> what, what a wonderful comment. It, Nathan's exactly right. And I've said it <clears throat> many times. The low in unemployment is before recession. It's confirmation that you're not in recession. I understand that, sh that spending patterns on the consumer have shifted from goods to services. But how long can that continue with credit card borrowing going vertical and with excess savings being burned up? The key metric we're looking at is, is the savings rate, and uh, the savings rate remains uh, low by historical uh, metrics. It's running around 4.5%. Another prism into this is the quote-unquote excess savings, and by our reckoning, there's still some. But it really boils down to the question of when is that savings rate going to normalize? And as all I know is that for the last few quarters, it's been pretty stable at around 4.5%. And that makes me think this thing could continue, and particularly the strength in services spending, could continue for maybe a couple more quarters. Maybe there'll be another discussion in early 2024, but through the end of this year, things are looking pretty solid. Well, has that dovetail then, Nathan, into this idea of some spike in unemployment and this sort of hard landing type of narrative that has been all but taken off the table? Right. So on the one hand, we've had the labor hoarding, in my view, in the manufacturing sector, maybe some of that's starting to give. But I think that we need to see some easing in, in services spending, a rise in the overall uh, savings rate. I think we will see that, but it's more likely to be an early 2024 story. And there's more uncertainty around it. I mean, many of our competitors are shifting their uh, macro calls away from recession in early 2024 to soft landing. You know, based on history and the tightness of the labor market and some of the imbalances in the economy, we're not there. We still think that there will be a recession next year. But boy, uh, this is a very, very finely balanced call between soft landing and recession during 2020. Well, let's talk about the Federal Reserve calls between you both. Bob, going into the summer, you were calling for rate cuts potentially as soon as September. Where are you now on that call on Fed policy? Uh, we think this is going to be closer to 1981, where the Fed didn't start cutting rates until right on the doorstep of recession. So if we're right, recession happens sometime right around year end. That's when the first rate cut should be. So no, no rate cuts in September. So there's a bit of disagreement between you both. But when it comes to the Fed, I imagine you're only a few months apart. Rate cuts in potentially the turn of the year. Where have you got rate cuts? We, we've got them in Q2. So there we go. So we're arguing over six months here? Broadly, I'd say broadly speaking. Now, where it gets a little trickier is if we're wrong and there isn't a recession and we're looking at a soft landing, I think a feature of a soft landing scenario that is not getting enough attention is it means the rates are going to be higher for longer. That recession is going to open the door uh, if, if and when it occurs, to more aggressive Fed rate cuts. If we don't get it, it's going to be a gradual glide down in the Fed funds rate in coming years. When you say that rate cuts are going to happen, does that happen well before inflation rates are south of 3 percent? I think that in, in engaging inflation, it's really important to be looking at those monthly prints and thinking about them. And I think that it will happen... Uh, in our forecast, kind of in the second part of a two-quarter recession. And by that point, the Fed will be fairly confident that inflation is moving down sustainably into the two, two and a half percent range. Bob, I wanted to give you the final word because I think the kind of things you're talking about in the long term aren't getting enough attention. Do you still have the view that we've broken out of this world of rate hiking cycles, rate cutting cycles going from lower lows to higher highs? Are we making that shift? Are we leaving the third, last 30 years behind? And as we go forward from here, never mind this cycle, but the next one, the one after that, are we going to a world of higher lows and higher highs in each rate cutting, rate hiking cycle? Yeah, absolutely. The last 20 years look to be the anomaly to us. We think we'll go back to something that looks more normal. I like to tell clients, go to that first dot back in 2012, the median long-term estimate of neutral Fed funds was four and a quarter percent. 
makes a lot of sense to me. You're targeting 2% inflation over its history. To that point, the real Fed funds rate had been two and a quarter percent. Slap the two together. There you go. There's a real cost to borrowing and spending. That's an active, vibrant economy. We think we're surely headed back to that. But the path may be zero to five and a quarter, five and a half, then back to somewhere around two and a half to three percent. And next time, maybe, you know, up to 6% and then back to 4 4 and a quarter percent. Big changes, Bramo, potentially. What this means to me is that the market's going to get less and less interest rate sensitive because everyone will just wait until things go back down to zero to refinance for 30 years. So it'll mean that nobody has any interest rate sensitivity whatsoever. Well, going from zero to three and then from three to five over time will make a difference, right? It should, but this is the sort of question. At what point does that volatility render it completely unuseful in terms of a tool to really control inflation? Bob, this was great. It's good to see you. Bob Pleasure. Thank you, sir. And to you as well, Nathan. Just awesome. Thanks for dropping by on the latest ADP report. That number, 324,000. The previous number, 497. The estimate, 190. Payroll's coming up on Friday. Coming up on the open in about 25 minutes from now, Mo Hagbin of Invesco, Chris Mamani of Lafayette College, Laurie Calvacina of RBC Capital Markets from New York City. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. We are getting some data from the Treasury Department as they announce what they plan to do with their financing for this quarter. The expectation is that they are going to borrow quite a bit more than they previously expected, which did lead to a sell-off in the 30-year. Uh, just uh, yesterday, yesterday afternoon, right now in the 30-year Treasury, you can see it going up 4.1 percent. That is the highest level going back to November. Joining us now with the latest numbers from the Treasury Department is Michael McKee. Mike. Well, Lisa, the Treasury said they were going to borrow over a trillion dollars in this quarter. And the question is, how are they going to pay for it? Well, pretty much as the market expected by raising auction sizes. Not so much in August, but they're going to raise throughout the quarter. Here's the first refunding numbers that come out for this month. These will be auctions held next week. $103 billion total, uh, refunding $84 billion in, in maturing securities and raising $19 billion in new cash. And as you can see, three Three-year note at 42 billion, 10-year at 38, and the 30-year bond comes in at 23 billion for next week. Now the increases I talked about are going to be relatively substantial, but again, not unexpected. Uh, they're raising the. Uh, Two year by nine billion, the three by six, the five by nine, and then seven, uh, ten, and thirties as well as uh, they go through the quarter. They will uh, parcel this out month by month, but it will end up uh, with a much higher auction schedule. And they say going forward, it'll depend on the performance of the economy and, of course, what tax receipts come in. One other note of interest in this release is that the Treasury says it has made significant progress on its plans to implement implement a regular buyback program in 2024. Uh, they don't have that program in place yet, but it does seem to be moving forward. So that is something to look forward to perhaps at the next refunding. We'll see you in November for that. And just real quick here, it also says the Treasury does expect auction sizes to be boosted going forward. So how much is this a sign? This is just a, a signal of what's to come. It's a signal of what's to come. Uh, but again, the mixture is what matters to the market. Uh, they do say they're going to raise uh, Treasury bill issuance some because they're still trying to rebuild the Treasury general account and get to $600 billion by the end of September. All right, Mike, stay close. Uh, we're going to follow up on this in just a bit. What you're seeing in the market is a pretty tepid reaction. The two-year yield did surge on the heels of what we saw at the ADP report that came out with the jobs number higher than expected, just a, a little bit higher than where we started the session, 4.89 percent. That's where it settled down after this announcement. Similar kind of muted action, 4.1 percent on the 30-year. So not a lot of drama. This was really baked in already yesterday afternoon when we got the news. Still, though, there is this broader backdrop today after Fitch downgraded the U.S. is credit rating of what debt does to the profile of a nation that is seeing its interest expenses surge and a lot of its spending also stay fairly high. Rob Arnott joining us right now, chairman of Research Affiliates, who is an incredible theorist on all things markets and has been for years as he manages money as well as advises on a PIMCO fund and uh, does a host of other markets-related activities. 
to me, there is a key question here. At what point do you care, not about the Fitch rating, but about the debt overhang that does have a much more expensive profile? The debt overhang matters, but it matters less than the spending. If the spending was under control, the debt would be just fine. Uh, the fact that there are buyers for the debt tells you that it's okay. Now, John Malden likes to refer to the bang moment when everything's going fine and then suddenly, bang, it's not. And no one knows where the bang moment is, but it's out there. And so we have to be very, very concerned, not about the deficit spending, but about the spending itself. Every dollar that's spent by the government represents resources, human resources, financial resources, um, being pulled away from the private sector where products are created that people want to buy into government programs. Uh, how often do we go mm, consciously seek out government to uh, help us on this or that? Not so much. Well, what we're seeing right now is a number of candidates for president who are coming out with economic plans, none of whom are going to say that they're going to cut Social Security because that's dead on arrival in terms of political candidacy. Correct. And on the flip side, you see interest expenses rising, and there is this serious consideration of at what point this matters on a fundamental level. As an investor, when do you start to say, we need to build in a higher premium, risk premium, yield premium on Treasuries? Well, I think the market's telling us that that's happening. Now, it's not necessarily happening on equities just yet, but that does represent a risk. Uh, we came out with a report just two days ago taking a deep dive on, on inflation. Back in January, uh, we looked back at 2022. We found that 6.5% inflation was about 6% in the first half of the year and half a percent in the second half of the year. That's a percent a month, first half of the year. Uh, a tenth of a percent a month, second half of the year. Why does that matter? Coming into this year, we assumed, what if inflation month by month throughout 2023 exactly matches the three-year average, 46 basis points a month? Well, if you replace 1% with 46 basis points, year-over-year -year inflation will seem to be dropping half a percent a month, but it's an illusion. If you replace a tenth of a percent, with 46 basis points, it'll appear to be rising a third of a percent a month, but it's an illusion. So flatline inflation during calendar year 2023 won't look like a flatline, it'll look like a V. And, that, and we showed that um, with that really simple assumption, inflation would fall to 2.9 by mid-year and rise to 5.7 by the end of the year. So just taking a step back and the overview, the lead on this is you think that there is a much greater risk that inflation resurges and, and goes uh, substantially higher and stays higher for a longer period of time than the market is currently accounting for. How are you translating that into where you're positioning? What's being mispriced in markets right now? Inflationary shocks, and it's interesting. <clears throat> it shouldn't be a shock that inflation tanked the first half of the year. It shouldn't be a shock if inflation rebounds the second half of the year because of the months we're replacing. We're replacing no inflation with some inflation. And so what shouldn't be a surprise sadly is a surprise. Most Fed watchers are thinking we'll finish the year a little higher, three and a half foot, maybe four. And uh, they haven't done their arithmetic. That would imply one to 2% annualized inflation in the second half of the year. The investment implications are straightforward. Inflation surprise is a risk off trade. Inflation surprise means risk assets don't do as well. And so I'd be cautious coming into the second half of the year because most investors will be surprised by inflation. Um, the Fed may be surprised by inflation. They have 400 PhD economists, which is four times as many as Harvard and MIT combined, but they seem unable to forecast GDP, unemployment, inflation. If they can't forecast it, how the heck are they going to manage it? Which has been something that's a perennial concern and one reason for uh, the credibility gap that you keep hearing people uh, yeah. talking about. You said that, that uh, things sort of chug along and then there's a bang moment. Right. And that's kind of when people come to some realization. Do you have a sense of what that catalytic moment would look like, what it is? 
Uh, firstly, I think it's a ways off, but it can happen in a recession where you find that you want to stimulate and <clears throat> the markets won't let you. So that happened with Greece in their debt crisis in 2011. Um, and we're not Greece of 2011. Let me get that straight. But um, we're headed that direction, which is alarming. Wait, hold on a second. So you're basically saying uh, that the U.S. will not be able to borrow in the way that they think they're going to be able to borrow at the rate at that they want to borrow. At some stage. At some stage that and could be that moment. Whether that's three years from now or 12 years from now, I don't know. But the current trajectory has us. Uh, it's like Wiley e. Coyote uh, running off a cliff and suddenly looking down and then he falls. Well, and this is what some people are <laughs> pointing to, that the idea that we have the debt profile that we do at a time when the unemployment rate is 3.5%, 3.6%, is concerning to some people because where does that leave the juice to stimulate? Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan Asset Management was just here, and he was saying, well, actually, it's a backward-looking indicator, and the economy mm -hmm. isn't that strong. Do you push back on that? that there is this sort of loss of momentum, this loss of strength under the hood that you could see in some small corners that will come to the fore more meaningfully later on. Well, I think he's right. The economy always looks booming just before a recession. And people think, how can anything go wrong here? Uh, now, the good news is there's two job openings for every job seeker. Um, that's unusual to have that in advance of a recession. But we do have an inverted yield curve. Cam Harvey, who's been on, on this show, I believe, uh, was the one who first discovered that a, an inverted yield curve predicts a recession. I don't think it predicts a recession. I think it causes a recession. Well, here's the uh, that's actually a, a good question around the uh, opportunity to lend long versus lend short and what mm -hmm. that does to people's money. Just sort of in sum, and, and I, I think that this is the important thing, this is a high moment of uncertainty, and everyone keeps talking about that. And so uh, maybe it's a better thing to talk about the distribution of risks and to understand the probability of certain risks and how they're priced. Which probability is the least priced or the most mispriced that you see right now in markets regarding the economic trajectory? The most mispriced is inflation, um, the, the break-even inflation, which is the difference between tips yields and treasury bond yields is 2.2 percent. Um, our work suggests that three to three and a half is a more likely 10-year number because it takes a while for recession to get, uh, for inflation to get reined in. And uh, we did a study looking at uh, four, all 14 of the developed economies that were already developed in 1970. Uh, 50 years of data on 14 countries. When inflation crosses 6%, and especially when it crosses 8%, it's rarely transitory. It's usually a consequence of policy blunders. And the inflation doesn't really get set, settled down until the policy blunders are reversed. We're not seeing that yet. Robert not. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Robert Knott, uh, Chair of Research Affiliates. If you are just uh, joining the program, we are seeing S&P futures uh, substantially uh, unchanged. I mean, they're down a little bit after uh, yesterday, uh, also being somewhat range-bound, perhaps taking a breath. We're seeing a decline of six-tenths of a percent, 45.72. And Michael McKee, a Bloomberg Economics correspondent, back with us after taking a look more closely at the refinancing agreement. And I have to say, it is really quite uh, material to me that this is the discussion of how much more the U.S. Treasury Department has to borrow at a time when we're talking about the credit rating <laughs> of the company, uh, of the company, country, I should say. Excuse me. I'm just wondering whether there are any details that you think people should be paying attention to in this refinancing agreement that do point to the borrowing proclivities of the United States. Well, it's almost the uh, borrowing needs uh, release that came out on Monday that gets your attention because they're going to borrow a trillion dollars this quarter and next quarter they're going to borrow a little over 800 billion. So you're talking about $2 billion uh, in the last half of the year, or trillion dollars, I'm sorry. 
sorry. Uh, and and that is it's hard uh, to lose. Yeah, it's, it's hard to hard here, to keep track. Trillion there, uh, and that's a significant amount of money. But it doesn't seem to be moving the markets at all in terms of repricing uh, risk. And you look at the term premium for the two year, the ten year. They're still well negative. So the market is telling you it's still going to buy this stuff. Um, it'll be interesting to see now that Japan is maybe moving forward to getting rid of yield curve control, whether that brings money back to Japan and away from buying some of these U.S. Treasuries. We'll see what the, uh, uh, the, the numbers tell us when these auctions are, uh, take place next week. But it does seem that um, this is something that if projected out can't continue. But then you uh, think about uh, <laughs> the old law about if it can't continue it won't. Stein's <laughs> law. Um, and, you know, we'll see. Michael McKee, Bloomberg Economics correspondent. Thank you, as always, uh, for all of that. I'm looking right now at a two-year yield at session highs, 2.9 percent after a, an ADP number coming in substantially above expectations, as well as a refinancing agreement, uh, a refinancing plan by the U.S. Treasury Department that is higher than they indicated a while back. This is Bloomberg. It is interesting, and it does cause people to stop and pause and ask these questions, which they should ask. And in terms of the last 20 years, I would say there has been an erosion in terms of the U.S. and our governance relative to other countries. Even though these are really vanity ratings from a practical perspective, it causes you to ask the questions because over 50 years, 100 years, eventually you do lose flexibility. But in terms of are we doing a trade on this? No. Vanity ratings, a fantastic description as many people shrug off the Fitch downgrade of the United States to AA plus from AAA. That was Robert Tipp, chief investment strategist at PGM Fixed Income, who was on earlier with us to talk about uh, the rating shift. And it comes at a time where we just got the Treasury Department saying they are going to borrow a trillion dollars in this quarter versus seven hundred and thirty three billion dollars previously expected. A big question in the market today is how much much the political instability, the political questions, some of the uh, overhang is really going to cause volatility in markets amid earnings that have been coming in strong. Gina Martins Adams joining us right now of Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, Gina, how much are you seeing any sign that we could end up with uh, volatility in markets, some response, some adjustment to the political overhang? I think the equity market will take their cues on the political environment from the bond market, frankly. And so until you see some elevated vol volatility emerge in the bond market, it's unlikely the equity market will pay attention, mostly because of the point we are in the earnings stream. As you noted, earnings are coming in significantly better than anticipated. More than 80 percent of companies beat expectations so far this reporting season, which are statistics we haven't seen since 2021. Um, really strong earnings beats are translating into pretty consistent outlook improvements for 2024. So the equity market is going to tie to that sort of earnings environment. Recall coming into this year, we were anticipating a massive earnings recession. At least that's what our model suggested was implied in prices. So not to get that earnings recession is the, the trigger for equity market sort of strength. Uh, unless the bond market starts to capitulate or create some sort of waves for the equity market, the equity market's going to look at that er earnings data and, and certainly tie to that, in my in my view. Gina, one thing that people have been talking about this morning, especially after the Fitch uh, development, has been why the equity market has not responded to higher yields that are inflecting higher yet again today. Do you think that that is an accurate assessment, that equities have not responded to these higher yields, or do you think that the earnings have been good enough for a lot of traders to just look past that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just very short term thinking, frankly, if you look at the longer term equities did respond to the higher yields in the form of valuation suppression over the course of the last year. And when you look at the equal weighted index, the equity market is still trading well below its pre pandemic average levels. So I think a lot of that is really just short termism. Uh, you know, the equity market doesn't necessarily plot hand in hand with the bond market on a day to day, week to week, month to month basis. But over the long term, you would anticipate that higher bond yields would translate into lower valuations. And that's pretty much exactly what we've seen. 
with the exception of the biggest stocks in the S&P, which of course have re-rated to enormously high premiums relative to the rest of the market. And that's really about the earnings outlook. That segment has re-rated sort of anticipating a much, much stronger earnings environment emerging as a result of some secular shifts, in particular with AI, but also with what's going on in the semiconductors industry and some government programs in response to the pandemic. So I do think you have to decompose the equity market into its moving parts to really get a clear analysis of what's going on. And I certainly wouldn't suggest that the bond market is the only factor that drives stocks. Meanwhile, in the bond market, we are looking at the United States saying that it is going to continue to increase its borrowing after uh, planning $103 billion in debt sales and announcing some of the refinancing plans. Joining us as well is Ira Jersey, who covers all things rates for us for Bloomberg Intelligence. Ira, can you get us a sense of how well this is being priced in in terms of the degree to which the Treasury Department is going to have to ramp up its borrowing? Yeah, so, so the, the Treasury Department the, just this morning, uh, about 20 minutes ago, announced that it was going to increase uh, the, the amount of uh, two-year notes, three-year notes, you know, all of the, the Treasury uh, coupon auctions are going to be increased by a little bit more than uh, what I think the market was expecting prior to Monday's announcement. So, Lisa, you mentioned that Monday, the Treasury Department told us they were going to borrow a trillion dollars instead of about $750 billion. So, we, you know, once we saw that, we, you know, everyone took a step back and said, hey, maybe there's going to be a little bit more issuance. I think that's one of the reasons you saw some weakness in the market yesterday, where uh, you had 10-year yields uh, go above 4% once again. Um, th that's an anticipation of this additional supply. So supply is going to have an effect on the pricing of, uh, of Treasury securities. Meanwhile, we are hearing pretty much a collective shrug about the downgrade that Fitch made to the U.S. credit rating. And Ira, I'd love your, I'd love your uh, take on this. We heard from Peter Shear over at Academy of Securities. He said, basically, nobody buys a treasury for its credit rating. Do you think there are longer term implications just in general with interest rates rising and just the idea that we are going to have higher interest payments and possibly a more discerning buyer? So I think there's kind of three components to what you just said. I think number one is there is no structural forced selling that's going to happen because of the ratings downgrade. So I think that there's this misconception that people can only buy AAA securities. That's not true. Treasuries are their own asset class. So so that's that's one thing that you have to get out of your kind of vernacular and, and your thinking when you think about the downgrade. Um, the second thing is is that yes, you're right. There will definitely be um, you know additional potential risk of of future downgrades. You know, Moody still hasn't downgraded the U.S. yet. That could easily be coming in the next couple of weeks or months. Um, and, and primarily because of that higher interest cost that you're mentioning, larger deficits plus higher yields mean that you have higher interest costs for the government, which really reduces fl fiscal flexibility. So what happens when we do get an eventual downturn in the economy that requires some kind of fiscal response in order to deal with the uh, with a weak economy? It, it, you don't have as much fiscal flexibility now with the interest payments being such a large part of discretionary spending. So, um, to, so the government does need to, and I, maybe this will be a little bit of a wake-up call to Congress to say, hey, you have to deal with some of the fiscal imbalance that we have right now and get them on a more sustainable path. Gina, from your vantage point, how much uh, do Treasury yields matter at a certain level? You said that right now they're not the main driver. You're looking at earnings. And to the extent that, the, that yields do matter, they are being priced in. At what point do yields become the dominant story for stocks? Yeah, they could become the dominant story if earnings growth deteriorates materially or the economic environment deteriorates materially resulting in another downdraft in earnings trends. If you think about the two primary drivers of stocks and the valuation side, certainly rates are a very, very strong driver of valuations. But then you've got earnings growth, which honestly rates have a very small impact on overall earnings growth in the S&P 500. So in an environment where earnings are actually Corner X Energy, you've got the earnings side of the equation really powering some greater degree of optimism working in the EV market. Gina. That's where the vulnerability would lie. You're, you're freezing up. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gina Martin-Adams. Ira, just final word here in terms of what you would look for, especially after some of what we've heard. You, we've heard from Brian Weinstein of Morgan Stanley saying that he sees the floor for 10-year yields at 4 percent. And then we've heard from Bob Michael saying, no, what we are seeing is inflation coming down rapidly. Do you have a view on where the market is pricing it and what's the likely outcome? 
Well, when it comes to inflation and, and where we're probably headed, you know, the one of the things that we the, we note is that you know the the size of the government debt market matters insofar as you know where how low you can get versus say Fed funds and and the pricing of other instruments. Um, I do think that ten year yields will probably uh, rally into year end if uh, if Anna Wong and the Bloomberg Economics team uh, forecasts are right, and we're going to see a weaker economy later this year. I would still suspect that we'll see a three handle on. On, uh, on ten-year yields uh, by the end of the year, maybe around three and a half percent, maybe even a little bit lower, um, depending on how weak the economy ultimately gets. And of course, that comes even with Fitch downgrading the U.S. credit rating. Ira Jersey, thank you so much for joining us on a day when very much the U.S. debt profile is in focus. Coming up on Bloomberg Television at 1 p.m., Richard Francis, co-head of the America's Sovereigns at Fitch Ratings, the person who everyone wants to speak to in terms of why this decision was made and why now, given the fact that we have seen the uh, debt-to-GDP ratio really kind of fluctuate and adjust even lower slightly as the U.S. economy has increased. Right now in markets, you're not seeing a major reaction to the uh, Fitch ratings downgrade, although you did uh, see yesterday a reaction to the refunding announcement that we got today from the Federal Reserve. The Nasdaq lower by about eight-tenths of a percent. The S&P lower by about six-tenths of a percent. You can see a little bit of dollar strength. The euro, uh, 109.64, yield slightly higher. That 10-year yield, 4.06 percent. And crude. We didn't talk about this today, but really a question, if we do have an ongoing economic recovery or at least strength, crude, how high could it go? $81.95, up 7 tenths of a percent, traded on the NYMEX.